Bonjour à tous. There are plenty of seats here to uh, my right, your left. So again, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to see so many of you here with us today, both in person here at the House of Sweden and uh, several hundred more online. We have a great program today on this timely topic of rights-based uh, conservation with an impressive list of experts, officials, civil society representatives and thought leaders brought to us by our close friends at the Rights and Resources Initiative. To start, of, uh, start us off, I welcome to the stage our hostess for the day, Ingrid Ask, the Deputy Chief of Mission here at the Embassy of Sweden in Washington. Well, dear friends, all of you who have come in this rainy weather to House of Sweden, uh, and of course all of you who have joined us uh, online, war warm welcome to our embassy and to the House of Sweden and uh, to this event today uh, to, on rights-based conservation uh, and climate approaches in 2023 and beyond. Yes, a very, very timely topic. And of course, a special thanks to Solange, Banjaki Baji, and our very close friends at the Rights and Resources Initiative, uh, who are actually the real hosts of, of today's uh, event. So today's topic, you might say, lie at the intersection of two very central and overarching Swedish priorities. And that would be, on the one hand, human rights, and on the other hand, climate change and biodiversity, both very important in their own rights. And a sizable part of the world's land resources is managed by indigenous people and local populations. Research shows that both flora and fauna often fare better in such places. Indigenous peoples and local communities' knowledge, land tenure systems and resource management clearly play a positive role in dealing with climate change, biodiversity and sustainable development. It is therefore a sad paradox that indigenous peoples, minorities and local populations are often displaced from the territories in the name of conservation. An approach to protecting biodiversity based on exclusion, but uh, not only risks worsening our planetary crisis, but has also led to forced evictions, violence, and even killings of indigenous and local human rights defenders. Sweden does not, under any circumstance, accept reprisals against those who stand up for their rights or for the rights of others. Indigenous peoples and local communities must be recognized as key stake and rights holders in conservation efforts undertaken in their lands and territories, as well as in decisions affecting their rights, lands, resources, livelihoods, and also food security. And this is why Sweden supports the important work of our partners in RRI. And it's also why we support programs to empower local communities uh, through partners, such as the Center for People and Forests, such as the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, the Earth Journalism Network, and there are actually many others that we work with. This is, of course, not to say that Sweden is perfect or that our history is not stained by how we have treated our own indigenous people. The Sami have lived in northern Scandinavia since the last ice age, some 10,000 years ago. And uh, when what we now may consider to be ethnic Swedes arrived in northern Sweden, Sami people um, uh, were mar marginalized and their land access, access circumvented. And Sami communities were forcibly displaced, some even recruited as, low, as forced labor. 
At the end of the 19th century, the devastating concept of so-called race biology led Swedish researchers to draw the conclusion that uh, the Sami were an inferior race. And the government at the time contributed to this xenophobia uh, by facilitating practices like skull measuring and similar practices by race biologists, an ugly part of our past. Sami children were placed in segregated schools. Today, the Sami people is recognized as an indigenous people and a national minority in Sweden. And this status means, in short, that the Sami have special rights, including land rights, and that their culture, traditions, and languages are protected by law. But that does not mean that we can turn a blind eye to the past. Just over a year ago, the Swedish government, in close consultation with the Sami parliament, decided to establish a truth commission on the violations of the Sami people by the Swedish state. The committee is to submit this long overdue report by December 1st, 2025. So they have a few years now to, to expose what happened. The fact that we are finally dealing with the troubled past also does not mean that there are no areas of friction today. For example, in some areas, Sami people have herding rights on lands owned by non-Sami persons uh, who instead have ownership rights. And in these cases, uh, Sweden, as any truly democratic country, aims to strike a just balance between different interests and rights. Although difficult and sometimes trying, these acts of balancing priorities and rights are normal for a democratic society as long as they take place on a foundation of rights, mutual respect, rule of law, and a common goal of reaching mutually acceptable agreements. So this is why actually tomorrow, the ministers and Sami presidents from Sweden, Norway, and Finland will meet in Stockholm to discuss the way forward for a Nordic Sami convention aimed at further strengthening the rights of uh, the Sami people to secure and develop their language, culture, livelihoods, and society across Scandinavian borders. And this is why I and my, some of my colleagues who are here today uh, at the embassy are so pleased to take part of the conversations here today, which I'm sure will be extremely enriching and informing and interesting for all of us. Uh, and by that, I would like to uh, turn the floor over to Solange. Please come and say a few words to us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ingrid, and everyone at the House of Sweden for the warm uh, welcome this morning. This is a full house, and we're very excited to have our coalition members, the RRI partners, collaborators. We have the donors, uh, people from Africa, Asia, and uh, Latin America, and around the globe. We also have our supporters, the donors who are here, and our colleagues from other institutions in uh, Washington, DC. We're very pleased to have you here. And I would like also to acknowledge the presence of uh, the RRI co-founders. Uh, we have Monsieur Arvin Carey, who is here, and welcome, Arvin, good to see you. We have Andy White, and I know Augusta Molnar is joining us online uh, from Colorado. We also have some former colleagues from uh, RRG, the Secretariat of the Coalition. And as we say, once RRI, always RRI. We are all family, so good to see you again. So thank you very much to everyone for being here. We are honored to co-host this dialogue in collaboration with our longtime supporter at the Embassy of Sweden. And as many of you know, uh, CEDA is a longtime supporter of RRI for more than a decade, supporting our work around indigenous peoples, local communities, and Afro-descendant. So we're very honored and pleased to uh, co-organize this event with the, the House of Sweden and the Embassy of uh, Sweden. I'm honored that you are all here today to share with us this important uh, milestone at the Rights and Resources Initiative launches its next five year 
strategic framework and program. Since its inception, RRI has undertaken a collective process every five years to define our global coalition's strategy for promoting the rights of indigenous peoples, local communities, and Afro-descendant peoples. The development of this five-year program, our fourth framework to date, is a collective inclusive exercise based on extensive inputs from indigenous community and Afro-descendant members including the women within this group and all the allies and experts. As part of the process to develop this strategic program, we consulted with over 100 leaders of grassroots network in, 2022, uh, in 22 countries, representing the voices of indigenous, Afro-descendant, and local community men, women, and youth. These contributors spoke of their hopes fears and dreams for securing and realizing their rights to land, forests, resources, and territories. This comprehensive listening exercise is resulted in the publication of our report, From Darkness to Blue Skies. I'm pleased to share the findings from this report with you today. You can find a copy of this report as well as our strategic program in English, French, and Spanish at the registration table please do take a copy. You can also use a QR code at the registration desk to scan and visit our website where you can download these materials. And for those joining online, you can find both publication on the event page on our website. Today, we have about 160 participants in the House of Sweden and hundreds of participants joining online, more than 500 and from diverse backgrounds, including multilateral institutions, conservation organizations, the private sector, donors, and NGOs. The first panel today will focus on the findings of the report with panelists from the RRI coalition. Major progress has been made in supporting the tenure rights agenda and the need for right-based approaches to climate and conservation action is now broadly recognized. We have seen donors and philanthropies formalize new funding commitment for IP and LCs, meaning indigenous peoples and local communities, and proponents of voluntary carbon markets are actively engaged in the development of high integrity frameworks with clear safeguards, safeguard measures to protect human rights. Yet, translation of these growing commitments into clearly defined actions remain an ongoing challenge. And despite the growing calls for indigenous people and local community involvement in decisions that affect them, their voices remain peripheral to the actual design and implementation of initiatives by government and non-state actors. Our second panel will help address these critical issues. Today, as we embark upon the ambitious agenda proposed in our new five-year strategic program, our coalition members have recognized the need to catalyze global ambition, coordination, and innovation to scale up the agency of right holders to the level and pace required to achieve the 2030 global climate and conservation goals, and mobilize key constituencies, networks, data, and tools to drive support for community land tenure, governance, and self-determination. All of this means that the need for RRI to radically accelerate our work toward a more just, equitable, and sustainable future through ambitious collective actions is greater than ever before. It is my hope that this event will be a unique opportunity to listen to innovations and ideas for strengthening and building new partnerships that will shape right-based conservation and development in 2023 and beyond. And it is my pleasure now to introduce the next speaker and moderator of the first panel, Board Chair, uh, Right of Rights and Resources Group, Dr. Peggy Smith, who is a professor emeritus at Lakehead University in Canada and a longtime indigenous rights expert and activist of Cree ancestry from Canada's James Bay Treaty No. 9 area. Peggy, welcome to the stage.
So today we are going to have a panel of some of those folks who participated in the Blue Skies exercise so that you can hear directly from them what their vision is for improving Indigenous land rights um, over the next while. So I'd like to ask our panelists to come forward um, to the stage. Um, Cecile, Gustavo, um, is Arcana with us today? There you are. Okay, does anybody need a headset for translation from Spanish to English? And I probably need one too. And, um, Kimaran. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Okay, after Gustavo. Uh, Gustavo's last on my. Um, I don't think so. No. Because it's good to shift. It's good to shift here. Strange. How is that? Watch out. How are you? I'm good. Okay. Yeah, my brother. I have to be close to you. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> So, uh, we are. And, um, and we do have one of our panelists online, um, Jose Luis Wengifo, um, who will join us uh, after uh, Gustavo speaks. So what I'm going to do first is to introduce each of the panelists, and then we'll have a couple of round robin questions for everyone, and then based on People's different experiences will maybe focus in a little more on certain issues like um, women's involvement uh, in um, social change. So I'd like to start with on my left, um, Cecile Njibet. She's founder of the African Women's Network for Community Management of Forests, or RIFACOF, uh, in Cameroon. Um, she, the organization ensures the representation of women's interests in environmental policies across 20 African countries. 
uh, Cecile won the 2022 Wangari Matal Forest Champions Award and was recently named a Champion of the, of the Earth by the UN Environment Program following. Oh, yes. <laughs> well deserved recognition. Uh, Cecile was elected Climate Change Champion of the Central African Commission on Forests in 2012 and serves as a member of the advisory board of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And of course, Cecile is a valued member of the Rights and Resources uh, Coalition. Uh, next, we have Kimaran. Um, just give me a minute here, shuffling around with papers. So, we, I know him as Kimaran. His full name, Stanley Kimaran Ole. Rayamet. He's the founder director of Indigenous Livelihoods Enhancement Partners in Kenya. He is an Indigenous leader from the pastoralist Maasai community in southern Kenya. He's the founder and director of that organization, Elepa, a community based Indigenous peoples organization based in, in Kenya. He's had extensive exposure and experience in engaging with and influencing international processes and mechanisms of interest to indigenous peoples, in which he has represented the global indigenous peoples movement in various capacities. He served as chair of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change, Anglophone African representative to the World Bank's Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, and most recently as Southern CSO's active observer to the Green Climate Fund. He holds a master's degree uh, in arts in development Anthropology from McGill University in Montreal and holds a postgraduate diploma in project planning and management. Thanks for being with us, Kimaran. Uh, next, we have Gustavo Sanchez Valla, member of the executive committee of the Meso American Alliance for Peoples and Forests in Mexico, uh, shortened it, that's AMPB. We, we love our acronyms. <laughs> Gustavo is a member of the Executive Committee of AMPB and President of the Executive Council of the MOCAF Network, a Mexican network of forest peoples organizations that has contributed greatly to the development of a country's rural regions. Gustavo also participates in many global forums to bring forward the voices of local communities and has recently been working with RRI and the Black Communities Process in Colombia to influence the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change's platform of local communities and indigenous peoples regarding the representation of those communities. Thanks for joining us, Gustavo. Uh, Arcana Sarang is an indigenous youth climate activist from the Korea tribe and member of the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change in India. Arcana is an environmental activist belonging to the indigenous Korea tribe from uh, the Banband village of Raj Gangpur in Sundargarh. I'm getting very much challenged here, in Odisha in uh, India. She works on raising awareness about climate change and documentation and the preservation and promotion of the traditional knowledge and practices of indigenous communities. She's also one of seven members of the Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change established by the Secretary General of the UN as part of the UN Youth Strategy. Welcome, Arcana. Um, now, can we see Jose on the, on the screen? Is, is he there? He's not there? He's connected. Hmm? He's connected, but we can't see him. Oh, there he is. Welcome, Jose. See you at this point. Yes, I am here. I am here. Thank you very much for your welcoming words. Balanta is coordinator and territory and natural resources of the territory and natural resources team of the Black Communities Process in Colombia. He's a defender of legal, environmental, and human rights of Afro descendant people. He's participated in numerous spaces within the RRI coalition, including building a regional collaboration with organizations of Afro descendant peoples in Latin America and promoting the representation of local communities 
in the platform of the UN Convention on Climate Change. He is also part of the Colombian Environmental Forum for Black People's Rights. Welcome, Jose. Sometimes I think, you know, when we talk about representatives of lo local led communities, indigenous communities, and Afro descendant peoples, we tend to think of people as being fairly restricted in their movement, representing their local communities. But obviously, this panel is um, widely experienced, involved in international efforts to improve indigenous peoples' rights, and we're very privileged to have them with us. So, um, I'm going to start with. Uh, a question, and I, each of you has a microphone. Okay, so um, we'll go in the order, starting with Cecile and ending with Jose. Um, and okay, Let me just get myself organized here. So I wanted to ask you, um, because the Blue Skies is a document about visions for the future, um, leaving behind maybe some of the problems and challenges that we are facing now, and thinking ahead to what kind of a world we want to create, I wanted to ask each of you if you would address what is your vision to achieve more funding, recognition, autonomy, and self-determination for the people in your territories. Cecile, want to yeah. start? Thank you. I, I, hope, I don't know if I have to use this. It's just OK. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, organizing this dialogue. Thanks to the uh, Sweden. I was very touched by your word. And uh, I think we have to move from all those uh, souvenirs to the future now, the brighter future. So what I would like to share is that uh, it's very important for us, of course, as a coalition, but also as donors, supporters, to recognize the leading role that women in the, in the ground are playing. Rural women, indigenous women, Afro-descended women, those are um, actors that are building, they have been building for many years, the nature we are benefiting from today, and they have very, very little uh, support from all of us. Uh, what they are doing, they are not that those victims, uh, we used to uh, call them, they are not those, um, uh, uh, how can I say it, uh, they, they are actors, they are activists, you know, they are, they are architects, the architects of our nature, of our environment. They are playing key role. They are restoring our forests, our ecosystem. So it's very important for those type of actors that should be at the center of all our processes, our decision making, our, our resources, to have a direct access to those resources, to funding, because this is what they are lacking. They have the capacities, they have the experiences, you know, they, have, they know what to do to care for our mother earth, to care for our nature and to keep our environment alive. But what they are lacking is funding. So my, my appeal to you is to bring your support to that effort that those women have been doing for many years now, for decades. If they are not part of that, if they don't have direct access to funding, we are wasting our time. We will never achieve sustainable development, Peggy. It's not possible without those women. Those are the, the foundations, you know, of all what we're doing. Our, our resources today are depleting, not because of them. If they were not even there, I'm not sure who would have what we have today. So I think what I'm, I'm appealing from you is to recognize that leading role they are playing, that key role they are playing, and to bring your support to those efforts so that we rebuild our nature. We need to, to give life to our nature, to the environment. And we cannot achieve that unless we put women at the center of everything. Rural women, indigenous women, and Afro-descended women, those are the foundation of our life, 
of our environment, of our nature. This is the message I really want to, to, to take to you. And the effort RRI and other partners are doing are very well appreciated. And if you are talking about, if you are recognizing Cecile as Wangari Matai Forest Champion today or, for a, or a UN Champion of the Earth, because of that work we are doing for decades with those women, those who are pushing for that, those architects, they are architects, they are not, they are not nothing than that. So please bring your support to that. We have now 20 million pro, uh, uh, trees program in, uh, with uh, African women. We'll have another program with Asia. We have another program with women in Latin America. Bring your support to them. Allow them to have direct access to funding to upscale what they are doing and to save our nature. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Peggy, and uh, it's great coming after my sister Cecil here thank you. for inspirations. So uh, my name has been mentioned, and I'm Kimaren. I come from Kenya, and I am a pastoralist uh, Maasai uh, based in southern Kenya. So I think we need to begin this conversation with some honest and um, candid but foundational questions. One of which is, where are the areas where the highest biodiversity concentrations are? Yeah. Who are on these landscapes that corresponds with highest biodiversity? Which land tenure arrangements presents better outcomes for biodiversity conservation and carbon sequestration. And if the answer to these questions are that these are lands with indigenous peoples, and these are collect land held collectively by indigenous people, as research has evidently shown, reaffirmed by the opening remarks by our host, Ingrid, then we need to ask the next question, why is this a case? Why is it that areas of highest biodiversity concentration are indigenous people landscape? And again, we know from research that the value systems, the indigenous cosmovisions or positive nature relations have contributed to this desirable landscape for both conservation and climate um, carbon sequestration. And if we could move on to ask, what is the trend of other social, cultural contexts and pathways to development, like capitalism, which sees development as as taking away and exploiting almost insatiably from nature to optimize pro, uh, profits. And the jury is out there that these historical development approaches of a vision of taking away without reciprocity as indigenous people practice is a reason why we are in the climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, and human needs development crisis. Mm -hmm. And we need to ask, given the scenario of indigenous people contributing the most to conservation and least to carbon uh, greenhouse gases, where are resources going? Are the resources available moving in tandem with the contribution of the different actors in the landscape? At least research has demonstrated that indigenous peoples are receiving the least. Less than 1% of climate resources, for example, are going to indigenous people. And we need to ask, what then would be the outcome if these landscapes were actually receiving the resources commensurate to what they contribute to conservation, to climate resilience, and what would happen if security of tenure 
the contribution that indigenous peoples are making to biodiversity conservation and um, low carbon footprints is out of their own volutions and struggle with minimal resources. What would happen if then resources were directed to these communities? And so the vision that I see of a future of a conservation that is rights-based and indigenous people-led is one that is honest with the realities that the actors contribute to this problem and solutions. One that accounts for power differentiation of the different actors and deals with it. One that restores the effective voice and agency of indigenous peoples in governance arrangements that are set in these uh, arrangements. One that recognizes that the devil is in the details. If we do conservation arrangement with agreements, independent legal arrangement for indigenous peoples need to be provided for. We need to be honest and truthful in the narratives we generate to account for the burden of conservation and the cost of this. Who contributes the most? Is it an infrastructure developer or the ones who have a well-conserved landscape? We need to account for the full revenue spectrum. We are talking about carbon credits. Indigenous communities are rarely brought on board on these discussions. And ultimately, we need to enable self-determination, responsive governance arrangement, direct access, and locking land rights for indigenous peoples. And thank you for listening mm -hmm. to me. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers, thanking the House of Sweden, and saying that I feel very honored to be here in this room with my sisters and brothers, Peggy, Cecile, Kimaren, and our colleagues who are joining us virtually and our Kana. With regard to financing, my take is that this is something that we need to rethink. We believe that the current climate financing system has been designed by governments to satisfy the needs or wishes of other governments, as well as to cater to large NGOs. One of the challenges that we face is how can we build an interface, or in other words, other mechanisms or new mechanisms for financing that allow us to have these resources reach the territories as directly as possible. At the Mesoamerican Alliance of Peoples and Forests, we're working hand in hand with other organizations to develop alternate mechanisms for financing that can prove through deeds that it's possible to have effective, transparent financing and achieve significant impacts in these landscapes and territories if we develop said alternate mechanisms, mechanisms that are managed directly by indigenous and local communities organizations. These mechanisms can work in coordination with other instruments for financing that already exist. And in this way, we will be able to modify the financing ecosystem that currently exists. For example, a mechanism such as Clarify that has a global vision 
should ideally work hand in hand or in coordination with these regional mechanisms for financing. So in so much as we can promote this and that we can trust in or believe in these mechanisms for financing, I believe we will be able to contribute to the financing reaching the territories more fully, a larger percentage of it reaching. I also believe we need to expand our expectations with regard to financing. Sometimes we're only thinking of donations, but we have to also understand that financing could have other sources. For example, combinations of resources with government subsidies or grants. Governments should not forget their obligations and responsibilities when it comes to managing and preserving their natural territories and landscapes. I also think an important source of financing could be savings, the community's savings. There are some countries that, for example, receive important remittances from groups of immigrants. Mesoamerica is a region where this occurred, where private investment is not where the greatest funds are found, but rather the remittances from immigrants sending it back to their communities and families. So if we could develop mechanisms that make the most of that saving, and if we could turn it into a investment for projects in their territories, it could serve as a very powerful tool when combined with donations and subsidies. And the other important topic has to do with markets. I believe that in the last meetings and summits, such as the ones that just took place on the topic of climate change and biodiversity, much attention is given to financing on markets. However, if markets don't have a strong rights component, this could also become a risk. However, it could also be an interesting possibility for financing for many communities. If we ensure that the rights framework is sufficiently robust, these would be some of my thoughts, Peggy. And there is no doubt that we are also, we agree with what Kimmeren and Cecile have mentioned with regard to the fact that we need to guarantee women's access to direct financing, as this is the best way to be able to bridge inequality gaps in our societies. Thank you. Johar, everyone. Uh, my vision is that the world where there is we are respecting the worldview of indigenous people and recognizing their role and contribution towards climate action and biodiversity conservation. Indigenous peoples, local communities and Afro-descendants have been contributing uh, towards biodiversity conservation and climate action even when these terminologies did not exist. And it's really critical to have that ecosystem of respect and solidarity between us. It's only when we have respect and solidarity we'll be able to work together and that's where we need funding allocation, that's where we need capacity building, and that's where we need support in different forms. And it's really important to push forward for rights recognition of indigenous people and local communities over the land, forest, and territories. It took us years of advocacy, struggles, a lot of sacrifices of our ancestors and elders that now we have rights of indigenous people over the land, forests and territories, an integral part of IPCC report for climate action. We need more support and lobby and which I think we all here 
have been working upon that how do we ensure that this is a key priority in the international policy making spaces and also is implemented in ground with taking into consideration the different laws and policies which work in the international spaces and the national spaces which again comes down to we need more evidences we have enough of evidences but we still need more evidences in more contextualization where we are being able to advocate for this in all spheres and through all sectors and all stakeholders being one of the few who are in the rooms where barely people talk about indigenous people rights recognition i think we need more people in the room to speak about indigenous peoples and rights recognition i want to see respect solidarity support and promotion of traditional knowledge and practices of indigenous communities local communities and afro descendant communities and in a place which is not pushing forward for again appropriation or taking away the credit of indigenous people in terms of the traditional knowledge and practices but a place where it is recognizing undoing the injustices injustices done to the indigenous people and local communities as a young indigenous women for over the years we have been marginalized and inferiorized because of our identity culture and tradition it's only now that the world is recognizing the role of indigenous people the identity of indigenous people the traditional knowledge and practice of indigenous people it again has to come from a place of respect and solidarity and from a place where we know that indigenous people have been contributing and have immense amount of knowledge and experience it is from a place of listening rather than imposition i want to see a place where we do not have to live in fear fear of eviction fear of land grabbing and fear of identity crisis and losing our livelihoods we need safe and enabling spaces for young people indigenous people local communities and afro descendant communities we need to strengthen and advocate for full protection of environmental human rights defenders and when i say this as my vision it also comes down to how do we materialize this or how do we actualize and see it happening i think we all have the power we all have the resources to do that it all comes down to willingness and will power it also comes down to how do we ensure that we are keeping young people in the center of all of these processes along with all the stakeholders in it we need an intergenerational learning we need intergenerational support and we need young people to be center of all of these initiatives and processes and this should enable the processes rather than creating hurdles in the processes and at the end i would like to say that young people indigenous people local communities afro descendant communities should be leaders of climate action and biodiversity conservation and not victims of climate policies and biodiversity policies thank you Jose Luis, can you join us online and share your vision? Hola, muy buenos días para todos, para todos. Good morning everyone. Well, I will would like to initially thank you for providing me this opportunity to participate in this space in a virtual manner due to some 
visa processes difficulties, I was not able to join you. But I am, despite of this, I am here with you. So in relation to the question you've asked, well, we've always proposed three different, let's say, scenarios within the framework of acknowledgement. We believe that all these funding processes must undergo through several scenarios. And we agree with the statements that have been exposed by my colleagues previously. However, for the framework of people of African descent is quite specific. For the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, some countries have established acknowledgement meaning acknowledging these peoples as Afro-descent peoples or Black peoples, or in our case in Colombia, Afro-Colombian peoples, and therefore we are rights holders. And within that framework, we are concerned about the two following points. Firstly, in each of these conventions, we are not acknowledged internationally. We want to be acknowledged in other contributions, for example, as tribe communities or tribal communities, which at the end of the day hinders us from being able to access these funds to be able to support our different activities and dynamics. We are the ones that have been protecting all these different natural resources, and this has been expressed in COP26, sorry, COP27, as you've all perhaps been uh, witnessed of. It was all very much focused on the Amazon protection, but it was not focused in other territories. Frequent exchange or dialogue scenario between the different peoples and, and acknowledge the strength that we can establish between indigenous peoples, Afro-descendant peoples and local communities. Therefore, we believe that there must be a funding mechanism that can enable that these three dynamics can develop their own actions. On the other hand, well, I believe for the case of Colombia, for example, how can we visibilize the Chocó region, the ethnographic Chocó region? We know that we're one of the most biodiverse countries at a worldwide level. To that extent, how can we protect that biodiversity, but not only just protecting the biodiversity, but also protecting the communities that inhabit those territories? All timber production, for example, that exists in our regions with great industries in our regions, for example, is being carried out by the violation of human rights. Therefore, we believe that it is necessary to tackle all these deforestation controls and degradation to our forests and jungles and to be able to create much more participative spaces with acknowledgement. On the other hand, we believe that if we can establish two greater frameworks, on the one hand, of funding um, in these dynamics, well, firstly, as I said, an acknowledgement to Afro-descendant peoples of uh, Caribbean, the Caribbean and Africa and Latin America, and secondly, to be able to create a funding, a mechanism funding that is direct or that is of direct access to Afro descendant peoples. Therefore, we must, or, or through these, we can establish a more, more, a much more balanced mechanism to support the work we do. Therefore, in regards to your question, what would be the great scenarios? It would be to, well, how can we strengthen and how we can create dialogue spaces between organizations and Afro-descendant peoples who are, at the end of the day, those that can guarantee the development of their own peoples and communities. So as I am virtually participating, I do believe that it is necessary that we can all approach this. We've been working in this dynamic together with Gustavo, uh, all this in relation to com to local communities. However, in this work, we've realized that it is necessary to create a participatory mechanism that can really guarantee the linkage of these peoples that haven't had a voice. 
their voice raised in these type of conventions. However, their voice must their voices must be raised to continue talking about these topics. That is, I would just like to leave it until there. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Two. I think you have to use the mic. I, I thought he was. This. Okay. <laughs> this one's not working. That one's working. Use that and help. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Is this working? Yes. Okay. So the, I think the cultural diversity lends lends strength, and I think we need also need to be aware of. Um, avoiding simplification of the issues that we're facing. Uh, I heard um, the, our folks in, on the panel present uh, a, quite a broad vision about where we, we could be in the future, uh, one that places emphasis on the role of women and the, the role that they have played in creating change at the local level. Uh, Kimaran talked about um, acknowledging the fact that uh, high biodiversity areas are those managed by indigenous peoples and the importance of uh, acknowledging the rights of self-determination of indigenous peoples. And key to that is indigenous peoples being at the table and having a, a decision-making role in all of these uh, various avenues that have, uh, have opened up around climate change and biodiversity. Gustavo was promoting the idea of independent funding uh, and uh, an emphasis on markets that would um, acknowledge Indigenous people's roles. Uh, Arcana gave a very impassioned speech about um, respect and solidarity and the need for Indigenous youth to be at the center of these discussions. And, um, Jose Luis talked about the recognition of Afro-descendant communities and the importance of independent funding for them, but also being at the, I think, the beginnings of recognition of those Afro-descendant communities who, until recently, weren't even part of the dialogue. So some very important thoughts on vision and how we move forward. I'd like to uh, turn now and ask um, Cecile uh, if you would uh, draw on your participation in the negotiations of COP27 uh, in Egypt and then the, the Conference of the Parties on Biodiversity in Montreal and what new opportunities you see coming out of those international discussions for policymakers to support Indigenous peoples, local communities and Afro-descendant communities, women, uh, women's leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think in the in Egypt in COP27, uh, we had the opportunity to launch the first global alliance of women. Uh, we call it um, uh, the Global South uh, for Tenure and Climate. This alliance was, it gave a, a lot of, I think it, we had a positive uh, imp, um, feedback from all the people that we, we met. This is an alliance of women from, the, from Africa, Latin America, and Asia, rural women, indigenous women, and Afro-descendant women. It's a big coalition. So far, we have 41 um, organizations in there. And our mission and vision were very well shared by uh, those partners and all those who were invited to the event. So that was, I think that was, uh, COP27 was for action. So we are asking for more action-oriented intervention. And we have explained that it is possible to work with uh, women uh, from the grassroots level up to the uh, global level. And it's possible. And I think that we have received good feedback, positive feedback. In Canada, 
We did the same. We, we talked a, a little bit about that. But I think the focus, the focus was now that the global framework is, is uh, adopted, uh, the, and in that uh, framework, we have um, a good place for gender, gender responsiveness. But what we have uh, required, or we are still asking for, is how can we ensure that the gender equality is really mainstream in the framework that has been adopted? So we needed, we still need, or we ask for uh, indicators and to ensure that we will have women participation at all level in the inception, elaboration of projects, uh, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. So in, 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 in COP15 in, in Canada, it was really about the place that women will be playing in this, the role that they will be playing in this new framework, the, the global framework that has been now adopted. And we also um, had the opportunity to uh, convey the message and the advocacy uh, uh, issue of that global alliance that was launched in, uh, in Egypt that we need, as I'm happy that it came out even this morning, that we need direct funding. We need direct funding to women now to help them upgrade what they are doing. We need direct funding to women to continue to secure their tenure rights. We need direct funding to women to continue to impact you know, positively our environment in conservation, fight against climate change, and in our own context, fight against poverty which is very, very important. So this is our key messages from those two events. And we have positive fe uh, feedback. And I think that mechanisms like Clarify have also been presented. We, we really explain why Clarify could be a good mechanism in, in channeling funding to those group of women that are in great need. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. And some of you may not be aware of uh, you've heard the term clarify. Um, the Rights and Resources Initiative undertook and has promoted the idea of direct funding in the international arena uh, with donors and with gover uh, governments and with private foundations. Um, this idea uh, that indigenous uh, peoples, local communities, Afro-descendant communities should receive, and women should receive um, direct funding rather than channeling it through now. Some, sometimes it comes through governments, sometimes it comes through the large non-governmental organizations that um, look after it on behalf of indigenous communities. So Clarify is an initiative between RRI and um, um, local communities and regional organizations to get that funding directly to those organizations. And uh, it's innovative, it's new, it's a challenging process because there are all kinds of issues around financial accountability that come from governments and donors. Um, and it's in its beginning phases, but I think it's going to be a model uh, for everyone to look at. Uh, when, so when people say, we want direct funding, I'm sure that there are questions in people's mind, well, what does that mean? And, how is this going to be done and who's going to be responsible and accountable? All of those things are being worked out in the Clarify process. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, Kimaran, would you be able to uh, share some examples of local-led economies that show how community enterprises can be aligned with climate and conservation agendas? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Peggy. and. Um, I think it's natural that perhaps I highlight the pastoralist experience, um, which is my community. Uh, pastoralism is a very central traditional occupation in Africa. About 43% of the landscape of Africa practices pastoralism. And my country, Kenya, is even much bigger because 75% of the country's landmass is arid and semi-arid lands. And 
rain-fed agriculture is not possible in this landscape. And so the livelihood that has demonstrated sustainability and drawing support for communities in this landscape is pastoralism. And pastoralism has been successful in this landscape for a number of you know, factors. One is the pastoral communities see the landscape as interconnected and interdependent. And so they have organized their grazing around dry season grazing, wet season grazing, and the land is collectively managed because if you fragment like the push for agrarian and rain-fed agriculture to privatize every space, you cannot privatize the clouds because rainfall is scarce in space and time. And so they have developed uh, um, an effective sustainable livelihood system, uh, practices in this landscape that has made good use of this landscape. Mm -hmm. This landscape, interestingly, also overlaps with the areas where conservation is being practiced. So when you look at the fortress conservation, when you look at the emerging practices around community-based conservations, these are the landscape in which wildlife, teeming wildlife, the big five, as they say in East Africa, are found. And so they have integrated not only land and natural resource management strategies, but a value system of connectivity between culture and nature. The clan system of the Maasai, for example, are reflected in nature. So you have the clan of the elephant, the clan of the lion, and so forth. And this value system, again, becomes the reason why this landscape is very rich with biodiversity. They have developed traditional customary rules, norms, and values that helps regulate exploitation of natural resources in this space. You cannot, for example, if you are harvesting herbal medicine and the active ingredient is in the back of the tree, you don't harvest that back across. You don't do a ring because you are suffocating the tree. You do a slit downwards. If the medicinal value is in the roots, you don't go around one, one tree and cut all the roots to bring it down. You do as you move so that this tree stays alive. So there are rules and regulations and customary practices that make sure the landscape is sustainably used. These landscapes, I've said, overlaps with ecotourism, it overlaps with community-based conservation, and it has made use of the most difficult landscapes in this region. But the tragedy is it is at the periphery of most resource allocation in development practice, both nationally and in the region. When accounting for carbon emissions are done and resource for mitigation is allocated, pastoral landscapes are often in the periphery. We think about tropical forest, but imagine a 75% landscape with woodland, grasslands, pasture land that is sequestering carbon, but is not in the mix of accounting mechanisms for carbon. It becomes a space for leakage to occur because we are focusing on high canopy forest. And so, so basically, one of the things that really we are pushing is uh, an approach to conservation and climate action that accounts for all landscapes a full picture view of the landscape, including arid and semi-arid lands where pastoralism is practiced. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a very important discussion, Kimura, and that's going on within the Rights and Resources Initiative, uh, broadening our perspective from focus on forests to all landscapes. Um, and, and in that way, taking advantage of the kind of local knowledge that the Maasai have in a pa uh, pastoralist situation that enriches our, our knowledge and our experience. So thank you for, for being a proponent of that, Kimura. Um, Gustavo is involved with, as I mentioned, um, AMPB, uh, but there's also a global alliance for territorial I'm trying to remember what the C stands for. Communities, thank you. And um, and there's also. Communities territorial. Yeah, Territorial communities.
clarify steering committee. So I, uh, Gustavo, given the efforts of the Mesoamerican Territorial Fund, the Shandia Initiative and other mechanisms to fill the gap of channeling direct funding to indigenous peoples, local communities and Afro-descendant communities, which should be the focus of allies and donors um, to drive these initiatives forward. Gracias, uh, Peggy, por, uh, Thank you, Peggy, for this question. I have the responsibility of managing the Mesoamerican Fund for this early stage, as well as I'm also involved in the Shandia platform, which is something like an umbrella that we have developed in the Global Alliance for Territorial Communities in order to promote direct financing. This initiative, Shandia, works together with regional funds, such as the one our colleagues in Brazil has, Podali, the Rio Negro Fund, as well as the initiative led by our Aman colleagues of a territorial fund, as well as that which exists in Mesoamerica. What we suggest to our donors and allies is five points that we should focus on. The first of these points is that we no longer see ourselves as donors and beneficiaries. Communities are investing, perhaps not financial resources, but they are investing time, knowledge, and effort to manage ecosystems and landscapes and territories. And very likely, the value behind that contribution is much higher than that which is contributed by governments, companies, and organizations. So we would like the approach to be that of co-investors. We are inviting you to co-invest to conserve, preserve, and manage the natural landscapes. We need to go beyond this vision of donors and beneficiaries. Another point that we are suggesting to our partners and donors is that we give ourselves the chance of trying out new reporting mechanisms and verification mechanisms. Currently, for some financing schemes, this is a large burden and very expensive, and oftentimes it's irrational. Perhaps so, sometimes it's more important to have the receipt in the accounting for it than actually having done the work or the training program or actually having carried out a project. Sometimes we see too much importance being given to this aspect. So there should be other mechanisms for reports and verifications that are less expensive and less burdensome. We also have to have a inclusive approach for ecosystems. And I agree with what Kimarem said. It's not just forests. There are other kinds of territories and ecosystems, uh, deserts, coastal, and others that are currently not seen. There are some very sexy parts of the world for investment and others that have been overlooked. And we need to see things as a whole. The other point is that we need to invite our partners, allies and donors to invest not only in productive ventures and initiatives, but also to invest in governance because we will not have successful ventures and initiatives if we don't have strong organizations. And we also need to invest in a rights framework we will not have feasible or financial bench, uh, feasible ventures if we don't have a robust rights framework in each of these areas. Finally, we need to have direct access for financing for youth and women, not only due to a social justice matter, but just because it makes sense. In practice, for example, women have 
proven to be better at saving, have demonstrated that they're better managers than men are, and have also shown that they can be much more responsible when managing projects, additional to the fact that they represent more than 50% of the population. The youth oftentimes are our chance for connecting traditional knowledge and modern technology. That is the contribution I'd like to make because I believe our time is running out. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Gustavo. And, and isn't it nice to get acknowledgement as women that we're better savers and better managers? <laughs> I think we could probably debate that too. Uh, Arcana. Um, so the Blue Skies Report identified the importance of increasing youth engagement in these initiatives. Um, based on your experience as a youth leader, what kind of challenges and opportunities do Indigenous youth see as a result of the recent global developments in climate and conservation? I'm very happy to see that there's a huge emphasis on youth leadership in the Blue Skies Report because I think that's the need of the hour. And uh, given engaging in this international spaces, I think what is crucial at this point of time is slowly and gradually the world is willing to listen to indigenous youth and youth leadership. And we need to emphasize and work together how we can prioritize youth leadership as center. And one of the observation which I have in this process is, is that young people coming from different backgrounds have different narratives, have different insights and experience. And we have more and more participation and representation from young people from Global North and other spaces. We need more representation and participation of young people from indigenous communities, local communities, and Afro-descendant communities in the international processes, national processes, and regional processes. Now the question comes across that how will the young people engage in these processes? One of the very key underlining thing is that the safe and enabling spaces on ground rights recognition of indigenous people over the land, forests and territories on ground acts as a key enabling uh, mechanism to ensure that the youth leadership is being brought forward in the spaces. The second comes down to contextualization and capacity building. Young people and indigenous communities, Afro-descendants and local communities have been doing critical and amazing work on ground. We need to identify them, we need to support them, and we need to have information and breaking down and synthesis of the global policies of the international frameworks to them, where they can contextualize what they're doing on ground and be able to speak on this international forums because I think everything in the international framework and policies is very complex it needs to be synthesized uh, to the communities and to the young people which requires uh, research which requires capacity building and which requires leadership program. And I believe uh, what we have in Blue Skies will cater to this. The second thing which I feel is really important is in terms of fund allocation. COP27 uh, had $1.7 billion for rights of indigenous people and local communities. And that's also what we uh, from RRI worked upon is like uh, climate finance should not leave behind indigenous people, local communities, Afro-descendants, women and girls. We had COP27 and we are working towards COP28. We should make and the world leaders accountable for the commitments made. 
what about the 1.7 billion dollar we didn't hear much of that in cop 27 now we are going towards cop 28 and where will the indigenous people young people be there in the 1.7 billion dollar that needs to be reflected it was really historic to see loss and damage uh, fund in terms of cop 27 and i just want to acknowledge the years of effort advocacy and sacrifices by our indigenous elders and leaders that we have been able to have that and small developing island countries it comes down to how will the indigenous youth and indigenous people local communities and afro descendants be placed in the loss and damage finance what about the economic and non economic losses we are talking about who will interpret that who will do the research it's us it's no one else because we have the experience we have the expertise and we have the ecosystem to do that and the world needs to hear it from us and that's why i feel it again comes down to perspective it again comes down to world view it again comes down to knowledge systems of indigenous peoples and enough has been said about funding but it's very sad that it's been so long yet we barely do have any fund allocation for indigenous young people or for that matter young people in general and indigenous people and local communities and afro descendants when we are talking about funding i would like to emphasize about intersectional approach in funding because there are so many times like we only fund um, just transition we do not fund rights recognition and there are several those kind of examples like you know we cannot fund young people and women we can only fund uh, uh, rights recognition i'm like it cannot work in isolation it is intersectional approach so funding has to be happening in intersectional way it has to have space for openness and willingness to make changes in the processes which is accessible to communities and not excluding them it needs to ensure that the fund allocation is directly reaching on ground and the communities have ownership and governance over those funding allocation most importantly i think it it's also really critical to see that how are we holding the world leaders accountable when we are talking about climate finance because we are aware that financing is coming through different channels uh, to the communities and it takes years to reach out to them do we need lobbies do we need research to push forward that the changes needs to be made in international laws the changes needs to be made in the national laws so that the climate finance can reach to communities and most importantly it's not like funding is of different types we have philanthropies we have governments agencies funding and how do we make sure that all of these fundings are prioritizing young people all of these fundings are prioritizing climate action all of these are prioritizing again very specifically talking about climate justice it's which is very different from climate action how we are emphasizing on justice being the center of funding which is again comes down to sustenance it's very important to have sustained funding which is one of the key gap which we have uh, heard from young people is that it's not only funding for one year or two year but how do we have a continued and sustained funding the other thing i would like to just quickly sum up is that there are a lot of terminologies which keeps coming as young people and group of young people and constituencies we saw a historic moment in cop 15 in biodiversity conference is that we had rights of indigenous people incorporated uh, uh, free prior and informed consent we also had full protection of human rights defenders but unfortunately we also have uh, terminologies like biodiversity offsets credits and it is really concerning we also saw the push for nature positive approach when there was a huge push for human rights based approach so there are a lot of terminologies like nature based solution nature positive coming across in this discourse and dimension i think it's really important for all of us to put our analysis 
to put our research on this that what does those terminologies means for indigenous people and afro descendants and local communities which again brings me that we should be leaders of climate action and biodiversity conservation and not victims of climate policies and biodiversity policies so awareness interpretation that what international policies and laws holds for us likewise like what's happening on ground and how we can enable it with international spaces which is like again we need to break the dichotomy of you know this is the national law this is the local law this is the international law the objective of these laws should be enabling and supporting each other which again people like us all over here coming from different stakeholders can play really critical role across the spaces bringing and bridging that gap with respect and solidarity thank you thanks sarkana Uh, we're going to end with uh, uh, a comment from Jean Louis and then open the floor for questions. We have a limited time for questions, so I would ask that you direct your question at an individual panelist because we won't have time to for each panelist to go through and answer every question. So, um, and it, also questions of clarification if there are issues. Um, or things that came up during the presentations that you're unsure about, we're um, happy to answer those two and provide some further explanation. Okay, Jean-Louis, um, we, we talked earlier about the, the, um, the new involvement of Afro-descendant peoples and um, that Afro-descendant peoples are still up un, underrepresented in, at forums in relation to conservation and climate. Can you tell us about uh, the agenda of Afro-descendant peoples, your biggest challenges, and your opportunities for the coming years? Peggy, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Peggy. As I stated earlier, through the support that we have received and the RRI's ongoing support, in the Americas and the Caribbean, we have set up a strategy to be able to ensure that the Afro-descendant communities are more visible. We worked on strengthening, but additional to strengthening and capacity building, we also began to work on how we could map all the Afro-descendant communities present in Latin America and the Caribbean. Through this exercise, we were able to develop a document that helped us to identify, for example, that there are approximately 205 million hectares where the Afro-descendant communities are located and carry out productive activities as well as conservation activities, conservation of biodiversity. But these territories are also there are about 400 or 403 territories that overlap with protected areas. So what is the agenda on this topic and how can we continue generating capacities among these 16 countries that guarantee that these communities are developed within these territories and landscapes? This is why we agree with what Gustavo said a few minutes ago, how can we develop capabilities additional to the productive projects? We also need to work on capacity building within these communities so that we can ensure that they can work on conservation in their territories. But this agenda is also part of the environmental activities and conservation activities. I am the coordinator of the Black Communities Processes, or PCN, and together with the RRI, we have been working on supporting a series of actions and measures. The first has to do with creating our own areas of conservation, as well as areas of conservation that can connect the Andean Valley communities, as well as communities that are on the Pacific coast and carry out a series of activities. We've also been working on a series of strategic measures within the framework of climate 
change mitigation. But we've also been working on greater involvement of the women in our territories. In other words, in the protected areas, those who are leading these processes are women. Although this is something that has to do with our organization in general. Our agenda has a lot to do with how we generate capabilities, capacity building. And this has to do with this policy process and everything that has taken place through the various COP meeting, how this can truly become a important setting or opportunity for progress for these communities. We believe and we are convinced that continuing these processes as a part of the national and international agenda will lead to development and the involvement of these various local communities and Afro-descendant communities to decision-making. We believe capacity building is what will make it possible for them to be involved in decision-making processes. So thank you very much, Peggy. Thank you, Jose Luis. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Did we have someone? Is there a mic? Jane. All right. Oh, uh, thank you very much. I think there was somebody already in front. Well, uh, my name is uh, Jose Monteiro. I come from Mozambique. I've been working with uh, uh, this topic for a long time and uh, adding a little bit more on data issue on, uh, on, on, on this topic. My question is for Shana, actually uh, uh, to all as well, to, to all, all the panelists. Uh, because Shana mentioned about accountability and we are talking about direct funding, uh, do you see <coughs> data and information playing a role here in ensuring accountability and traceability if there is going to be really direct funding because I, I definitely see a lot of gap between global and what's happening at the local, local community and the climate investment have been changing a lot this is one the second question is actually it's a, it's kind of a reflective question is i you know rri have been doing a great work we've been i think people uh, organizations that have been doing this uh, in the last 10 years have been advocating a lot for rights and it's, it's improved a lot. We have uh, registered a lot of uh, communal land rights and things like that. But do you see a role on shifting the way support is done? Because we are just talking about our rights, but we are leaving behind governance, which also trickles uh, elite capture in this community that we are talking about. We're leaving uh, a lot of tools such as land use plotting, and we have been talking about it. I mean, my, uh, the colleague from Kenya have been talking about it. How are the donors funding shifting the way we support or finance uh, uh, communal lives? Should we put it as a package? Because there are communities that are already here, but there are communities that they're starting. They still need the right, there's still the, all other tools to support the governments. Are we, uh, I mean, are the donors or the funding willing to do, like, if you're going to do a climate finance, should we put the disenabling conditions forward? Like, should we support that? So I just want to hear a little bit of opinions of the, of the panelists on these issues. Thank you very much. I think this question was for Jose Luis, if I understood correctly. Was it? But let's. So, Gustavo, I could perhaps respond to that first portion of the question. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. And I think it is a very, a very timely question. I think that at a regional level, we all know, and also at a global level, that data are a key tool for decision making. And as data are important 
tools for decision-making processes. We believe that through these tools that we've been advancing on, well, these have very much to do with governance in our territories. I believe that the lack of knowledge that has been disseminated in relation to African-descent communities in Latin America and the Caribbean specifically has certainly limited the possibility of funding to be able to create these type of actions and to be able to participate in the different discussions that have been led in relation to climate change. Thank you. All right, so I do agree with the fact that it is important to consider the, let's say, the cost of the follow-up of this funding, and this must be lowered or reduced. However, we must not sacrifice reporting or accountability, meaning that the person who's providing or the party that is providing the resources has clarity on, for example, having reached an objective and that everything has been managed with transparency and equity. That is the great challenge, I think, um, in front of us. How to, yes, find more agile mechanisms without sacrificing accountability nor transparency in these processes. And in relation to this other um, reflection that the person who posed the question made about investing perhaps in a, in a package, I think we fully agree on, on this point. I think that this investment in governance and in a rights framework must be considered as pre-investment elements, as, for example, when a great company will, is going to establish a branch in the region, well, they request that there's conditions for access to basic utility services, energy, water, qualified, labor, et cetera. That is how an investment should also work in terms of climate change, territorial or biodiversity conservation, that these governance elements and of a rights framework must be absolutely necessary. It's not something, it shouldn't be something optional, but rather mandatory. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, I don't have the benefit of hearing the Spanish. So if I repeat, it's not because they didn't make a point, it's because I didn't get to hear anything. Um, so I couldn't agree with you more with the two points that you make. One on data. If, for example, you pick climate finance as an area about data and accountability, there is a lot of rhetoric about increase in climate finance, whether it's bilateral, multilateral, you know, philanthropy, international, private sector, name it. And one of the biggest debate in the COP27 was what is climate finance? How do you differentiate additional climate finance from overseas development aid? Or is just a re-labeling, re, re funds to say it's climate, but there's no addition. There's no additionality. And so, and then again, when you look at 1.7 pledge to indigenous people, where is it? Who is making the decision where this funding is going? And so that idea of data traceability, accountability to, the, to where it's supposed to end is really, really, really very important. When adaptation, when loss and damage resources are committed, and you know in the context of climate impact, the state as a party is an abstract space. Where climate impacts are is at the community level. And so if you can't trace that financing to community spaces and ground, then it's just money lost in space, you know? And then on your second point about governance, and not just climate uh, financing, but a package of governance, tools, instruments, and decision-making arrangement is very critical. Increasingly now, what we are seeing as indigenous people, we are seeing a proliferation of indigenous people safeguards, by all actors. We are seeing free prior and informed consent granted by most actors. Mm. But was that the end? Were we just interested in institution ticking the box to say, we have a safeguard policy for indigenous people. Mm. Mm. 
Why are we just interested in having national guidelines for free, prior, and informed consent? No. We are interested in those facilitating realization of rights and livelihood securities on the ground. So projects are funded, but FPIC is not funded. Land tenure rights are funded, but FPIC to, part, to bring the visions and aspirations of indigenous people to inform decisions are not funded. So I agree with you that this should be a package of just not allocating resources, but the infrastructure to make it a reality. Thank you. Very quickly. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the question raised on accountability is really critical, and uh, thank you for raising it. Because when we were doing our call to action for uh, in, uh, climate finance should not leave behind indigenous women, girls, and from Afro descendant communities and local communities, barely could we find any research done on this topic. It's like how much fund allocation has gone to indigenous women, Afro descendant women, and local communities, women and girls. And that that's why uh, in our call to action is also like, as we have mentioned, that there is no data on this. There is barely done research on this. And that's why one of the findings was that we need more research to be done. And that goes slightly with the young people also. So I would like to emphasize that, yes, data and research is really critical in these spaces of climate finance, or even it is in terms of recognition of rights of indigenous people over the land and ter territories, because we also see that which areas have been recognized, how much of the areas has been increased in the recognition is really important and that can only happen from data and which there's no data or there's barely any data which we see in the national level or the international spaces also. The last thing I, I would like to just quickly sum up is that one of the challenges or the clashes which we were having in COP27 in terms of loss and damage fund is that people were saying that this is repackaging of the adaptation money uh, going towards loss and damage. And there was a conversation around how do we have more additional finance towards loss and damage, which is taking into consideration economic and non-economic losses. So again, when we are talking about this, as you rightly said, the full packaging is really important because communities, those who have recognize rights, they need livelihood support, they need leadership support, and the communities, those who have not recognized their rights, they need those support, it, which also comes down to how do we ensure safe and enabling spaces, which I'll end by saying that it's not only what indigenous people do, but who indigenous people are, their knowledge system, their worldview, and not only about what and how they are contributing, which also needs to be taken into consideration when we are working with them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, I think Just to add that we, we have realized that there are so many government and private and all these making pledges to, to fund uh, the climate, but how much of those have been translated into concrete funding? And within that, how much has been directed to indigenous as a group or local communities and within now how much has we got for the women so we i think the data is very important and and we need to to make sure that we we, we really see what is going on and how we can gather all that information to to make sure that yeah maybe we are adding burdens or we are just talking with that action because in, in COP26 already, we have so many government have committed to give the money. In COP27, we realize that from the COP26 to COP27, nothing has changed. And I'm not sure that in COP28, something will change. So I think we, all these governance, of course, with all these statistics, all these promises should also be followed up, you know, monitored and see if they have been translated into action and what portion of that has been allocated to women. Uh, my concern, of course, is for the women, but local communities in general and indigenous people, I think, is something that we, we it's a big challenge for us to, to gather. I think uh, what I wanted to add, thank you. Thank you. One more question. 
I thought I'd put it on. Um, thanks, Peggy. Thanks to all the um, the panelists. I think you've talked with them um, with great passion, um, but also more in generalities about what should happen in the future. So I'd like to challenge you, and perhaps Peggy, you can just pick one person uh, to say something very concrete about how indigenous peoples or local communities or people of, of Afro descent are actually conserving um, areas, maybe not just forests, maybe um, savannah areas as well. Mm -hmm. Because in advocacy, it's really important to come with stories, with practical examples. Mm -hmm. So could I just challenge you, before we go to coffee, to have some positive stories? Mm -hmm. Story to tell? Mm -hmm. Conservation story to tell? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think, yeah, it's a great... Um, we have, we have initiative in the field with women. I can cite a series of initiatives. When, when women are restoring uh, an, uh, an ecosystem, for example, we have an initiative in Togo with the ITTO and uh, some uh, things, Soga, Soga Kakai funding, where we have succeeded from the government to have um, degraded areas allocated to women, and now those women are transforming those degraded areas to a living uh, ecosystem. I think when the ecosystem is restored, you also have biodiversity coming in. And I can also cite some uh, uh, initiative with the mangrove restoration. I've just visited one community, women community like 10, day, 10 days ago. And I was so impressed that after five years, the, the, the ecosystem has recovered. And I, I could hear women saying, fish is back. Oh, oh this is the first time we have seen for the f last five years, we have not seen this quant quantity of fish. So fish is back. It, it means what? It means that as they have planted mangrove five years, six years ago, the, the environment has been restored. Biodiversity like fish and all these living uh, uh, um, environmental uh, 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 things in that environment is coming back. Now your question is very relevant. How can we measure that? Maybe that's the next step. What have changed when, when the, the situation was worse and now that is being recovered? How, how can we measure to see exactly we, how we, the, those women have contributed to restoring, to bringing by the biodiversity? That will be a good working experience, that we, another initiative that we can continue based on what is going on now. In Togo, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Cameroon, in the DRC, in all where we are trying to restore the ecosystem. Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually thought that pastoralism was a positive story. Uh, that demonstrate uh, the value of nature-based. They are talking about nature-based solutions like the thing of the future. And in the context of pastoralism, it represents the future is the world is looking for. Because the food uh, systems of pastoralism, the medicine uh, system of pastoralism, uh, the culture is integrated in nature. And it's a place to go to learn. It's not just a place of sympathy. They are part of the solution to these challenges. And also, we have learned as an institution of ILEPA, where I work, that the success of lobbying and advocacy is evidence documentation. We have just won a land case of a six-year struggle of a land-grabbing case and amidst a very corrupt system and have managed to win a restoration of several thousands of acres of land back to the community. But this is different because we managed to document. One thing we have learned is that the bureaucracy understand the language of the paper. If you speak to the bureaucracy without writing, you have said nothing. <laughs> and so we learned that um, for us to be able to have said something which is traceable within the bureaucracy, mm -hmm. evidence-based documentation mm -hmm. 
for these struggles becomes critical. Mapping actors, critical actors in the land sector decision making and their role and targeting them for that mandate they have and so on. We don't have the time to demonstrate this, but I think yes, there are many positive stories and uh, we are willing to share them given an opportunity. Thank you. So put it in writing. I'd like to uh, thank our, our panelists and um, you for your attention. Uh, we, we are going to roll right into the second panel. I'm going to ask Solange to come up and introduce them, but maybe in the interim you can just stand up and stretch, uh, take a few deep breaths, or get recharged, and we'll resume in a minute. Panelists from the uh, second speakers from the second panel and Liz Wiley. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm going to make it short. Johnson, Serda, please. Asil, Michelle, and and Christian. Yeah, Christian is here. here. Michelle is here. Uh, <laughs> Any more Johnson? <laughs> Johnson. Asil. <laughs> When you're done. Yeah. You know, one thing I want to probe, and I'll do it in one of your questions, was the issue of what direct funding actually means. Right? What, what direct funding means. Because there are many ways to do direct, and that's one of the challenges. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to at some point break that up. Absolutely. I don't know. He doesn't.
Hello everyone, please take a seat. We're starting now. We're starting the second panel now. You'll have time during lunch to network more. Please take your seat back. Thank you. So I'll give the floor uh, to Liz Alden Wiley, who is an RRI fellow and a land tenure specialist. And Liz will be moderating uh, the second panel. So, Liz, you, ha you have the floor. Great. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, sorry about the lack of coffee. You have permission to sneak out and grab a cup of your preferred beverage and then bring it back. Uh, but we are running out of time. So, uh, okay, this session is a bit different. Uh, the whole point of this session is to actually have the other side, not from our big constituency, those three billion uh, com customary communities, whether they're IP, other communities, or Afro-descendants, but to hear from uh, the international agencies, the donors, companies, and phil philanthropic funds. So we are extremely lucky. We have here, we have, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, Arcel? Did I say it right? Yes. Thanks, Arcel, from the World Bank. We have uh, Johnson, Soda, did I say that yeah, right? Johnson from Conservation International. Uh, which we're going to perhaps give them a little bit of a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Michelle uh, Zoling Zollinger, did I say that right? That's right? I am so sorry, I should have checked before. From Nestle, a company. Uh, so we'll be, that will be very interesting. And we also have Christian Samper, uh, from the Bezos Earth Fund, very important new actor in community-based conservation. We hope, we hope, so we'll ask him some questions too. Now, I, because of time, I'm not going to tell you anything about them. Together, they have over a century of experience in the field, in research, it's some of them in running really impressive international groups or groups here in America. Read the bios, and I think the bios may even come up, short versions anyway. So we can get straight on to the task. So what, uh, what I thought we should do on this session well, actually, I'm going to push the boundary a little bit here because I have the privilege for 40 years, actually it's 50, but I try to be younger, uh, of living in Africa. And last year at Kigali, at the African Protected Areas Conference, there were around 240 representatives from over 40 African countries from the indigenous peoples, other communities uh, at that conference. And they actually laid down a 
pretty hard measure or demand. They said, please stop talking about participation. We are talking about devolutionary empowerment to us. Please don't you dare take another inch of our customary land, whether it's legally recognized or not, to turn it into a protected area. Ask us. Put your investment into us as the guardians of our own unregistered or registered customary forests, rangelands, waterlands, streams, small rivers, mountains, deserts. Help us to become the front line of conservation. We want community owned and managed forest reserves, wildlife reserves, waterlands, foreshore. That's what we want, and that's where the turning point has to be. Now, that's a pretty tall order, especially for governments. And it's a tall order for this particular sector. But I want you all, if you could, just keep that in mind. Because I'd love to see, we would all love to hear how far what you're doing in your projects in your particular part of the big institutions you're part of, how far that is ever going to reach that 10-year ambition. Okay, so the first question, if, if I can, if this would move down, that I, I think the first thing, ah, it's not working, never mind, first thing if each of you, is this, is this working? Yeah. It is. I can stand away. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. The first thing, Johnson, let me start uh, with you. Tell us, sh briefly as you can, what your particular initiative in CI is and where it's taking you. Be brief, because we also, I'd like to move on to challenges and lessons and also, lastly, how, how far is what you're doing? Is it going to crack this objective of IP all customary communities? Thank you, Johnson. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation as well. Um, quick means at least five minutes or less than that? Oh, very, very absolutely no more than five. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, I'm Jordan Cerda. I'm Kicho from the Ecuadorian Amazon, working with Conservation International and um, leading a project called the Dedicated Grant Mechanism for Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities. Um, uh, long story short is that uh, this is a project uh, from the um, forest investment, part of the forest investment program, which is under the Climate Investment Fund. And it's just 10% a, a of the the amount that they have for forest investment uh, program, and this is dedicated for indigenous peoples. Basically, the project is, um, has two main levels. One is uh, 12 countries. In each of the countries, they have their own structure, and then one global project. That is how we work. Initially, we started with uh, 14 countries. Now we are only 12 because of situation in each of the countries. They didn't want indigenous peoples, perhaps, to manage the funding directly, and that's why they decided not to to receive that money, and we have only 12, 12 countries. We started with $80 million now. Um, I would say like we are uh, around uh, $70 million for that, those uh, 12 countries and the global project. Um, uh, let, me, let me say that we have like three main elements. One is the governance system. The second one is the technical support for the, for the program, and then the implementation itself and how they are they're working on that, and we'll, I will share some data on that. Uh, in terms of the governance system, we started in 2014 with an interim global committee. That, that's how we, we came up with Conservation International to support the program. And one of the members here, uh, Mina, is, is here. She's part of the global steering committee. We started in 2014 helping uh, some countries um, to organize their national steering committees. So um, basically, um, in the governance system, um, each of the countries they have their own national steering committees, 
And from those national steering committees, we have one member of those committees to the global steering committee in order to oversee or support the projects at the national levels. That's how, that how we are organized. But in each of, in, in each of the countries, um, what I have seen is that most of the countries, they have, um, um, I, I don't want to say use it, but uh, they have taken the same organizations already existing in the countries because they don't want to create anything new. We have already organizations there, so we have to use that. And that's the case, for instance, in, in Peru, where we had two main organizations for the Amazon, which is IDESEP and CONAP. They came you know, together and made up the, the National Steering Committee at the national level using the existing organization. It was easy in order just to strengthen what they have in there. But we had cases like in Ghana where we didn't have any like organizations like we have in Peru and, and many countries. So we had to make consultations there in the regions because it's not, uh, the FIP program is not in the whole country, it's only in two regions in many countries. I think except two countries where it's a national program. So we run, uh, we help them to run uh, consultations in the, those areas and uh, uh, to check with the communities in terms of the topics they want to work with this funding and also how to nominate someone to represent them at the national level. So it takes like time, first, uh, first of all, in order to set, the, the, to set up the governance system at the national level. So we've been supported from the global project for this, uh, this kind of um, actions at the, uh, at the governance system level, let's say. And we've been participating on, in, on climate change uh, meetings and presenting what we are doing. And we have said that we are doing a governance system, supporting governance systems well, for two years. And one of the you know, donor countries says that you guys are talking about governance system for two years. And we say, yeah, that's important because in order to run a program, you, have, you, you need to have a very strengthened uh, governance system. And that's why we were trying to set up at the national level. Then the second part is the, um, uh, the technical support. Um, te technical support in order to help this governance system to make decisions for the implementation of the project, how they are going to invest the project. So um, that was uh, important for, for them, you know, indigenous peoples and local communities and leaders to make a decision who is going to be a, a good partner for us to support technically to us and also to have res uh, fiduciary responsibilities for the World Bank. So that was, you know, their decision. and. In some cases, cases, they have negotiated. Like in, in, in Brazil, they said that we actually, we don't need a big organization to help us here. We, we want someone who is from here and helping and working with us uh, from long time. So we would like to uh, select someone locally. So they selected a local organization in, 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 in at the national level. In cases like Peru, again, they said that, no, we'd like to have big organizations to bring us some additional funding as well for the project. So. They made decisions uh, based on, on, on their own realities and their, their needs. So the, the third part is the implementation. And, and in the implementation part, I, was, I would like to say that um, it's been really important because the communities itself, they've been receiving the funding directly. Uh, you know, the decision making run by indigenous peoples. They make decisions where they're going to invest. Communities receiving the funding and implementing uh, the resources and also uh, mobilizing a lot of resources. Let me let me give you some uh, data on that yeah. uh, quickly. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah. All right. Uh, the first one I would like to say is that um, could we could we do examples next round? All right. Good. Yeah. Right. It's okay. Yeah. But yeah. Because I we really want to hear those yeah. examples. Well, I, I'll give you some examples uh, in the second round. But let me just say that. Um, it's been really important to see how this money uh, supported a lot of the communities, but also the expectation has, has been really big. In, in Burkina Faso, we had like six, 600 proposals for just 25 projects. And, and that was like, the question in the committee also was, how are we gonna manage this? We don't wanna raise expectation in the community if we are not going to respond to that. So there are the strategies that we use together with, with, uh, with our colleagues in order to address this. Uh, issues as well. So okay, I will come with great. it. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Asso, can you, can you tell us a little bit about your particular project in the World Bank and how it is targeting communities on conservation matters? Okay, thanks. I'll try to be within five minutes. Uh, I come from climate change group of the World Bank and we host a number of uh, big uh, 
funds which are result-based climate finance. And you probably, many of you heard about Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, which has been supporting 40 countries, tropical countries in readiness uh, process. And uh, we are now in the stage of result-based finance to 15 countries with amount of about 700 million to be disbursed within the next five years to 15 countries for results achieved in reducing emissions. So uh, to support engagement of indigenous peoples, local communities, uh, we uh, set up a program, and many of you have been part of this program, uh, capacity building of indigenous peoples, local communities on Red Plus. We realize that it's important for communities and for local organizations to understand, to demystify Red Plus, so they can start uh, thinking about how to engage in the program. So this program was uh, running for 10 years and it was uh, implemented through indigenous people's organizations and civil society organizations in, uh, uh, I think, about 40 countries. We disbursed about $15 million to small grants. So what happened, we had seven organizations in regions, intermediary organizations, which were disbursing small grants to smaller organizations in countries so they can work with communities on raising that awareness. And uh, that uh, uh, brought us to thinking that we need to do more and so we did assessment with Conservation International help of this program and we realized that we need to start reaching uh, organizations in countries. So uh, to sort of uh, start engaging them in practical result-based finance, right? So it's not awareness uh, was raised more or less. So we need now more capacities for these communities to get into policy, into decision making on climate finance and be a leading member of this uh, movement in the country. So we set up a new fund. It's uh, uh, called Enable. I think I have a colleague who is putting all uh, uh, links on the chat. So if anyone is interested, you will uh, be able to see this. So this fund is uh, enhancing access to benefits while lowering emissions. So this is completely and totally focused on inclusion of indigenous peoples, local communities, women, young people, other disadvantaged groups in our result-based climate finance. Uh, we learned a lot from dedicated grant mechanism, which is also run by the bank, and we, uh, all these lessons we incorporated into Enable. So uh, this program, I will say just three main principles. Yeah. It's first one, it has to be run by local organizations. As you know, DGM in many countries were run by international NGOs. We had a, a huge dialogue process with, um, and Josh was running national global dialogue, where IP's organization said, we want to start managing resources. So that's one principle of enable. Second principle, it's not just three, four million dollars per country. We want to create a supporting, enabling environment for indigenous peoples, for vulnerable groups, to be part of result-based climate finance. So they can be a part of this continuous stream of result-based climate finance, which we hope will be coming to countries with Paris Agreement and with development of carbon markets. So they are not just beneficiaries of this money as uh, humanitarian programs, but they also engage in reduction of emissions and receive a fair compensation for that. And the third principle is, um, I think it was very important today, uh, Gustavo said, we have to work, it's a small fund, we provide about $3 million per country for CSO to manage. So we need to leverage resources, we need to bring private sector. I'm happy to hear uh, today uh, representatives of private sector, how we can leverage development funds, public resources with private finance, and also make sure that governments become interested incentivize to bring all these vulnerable groups and communities in the climate action. So, uh, Great. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. 
lots more questions. I hope that do sure. <laughs> already start preparing to write your questions down. Okay, um, Christian, Bezos, your, your heading Nature Solutions in the Bezos Fund. Can you give us a quick rundown what that is? Sure, I'll be happy to, to do. We, we're the new kid on the block here and the, the Bezos Earth Fund was established uh, less than two years ago. Uh, through a very generous philanthropic pledge made by Jeff Bezos to invest in nature and climate solutions. By 2030, we're looking at allocating $10 billion specifically for this. And this is funding dedicated to support civil society organizations. We don't fund governments. We don't fund the UN. We're specifically looking at this. Within that, we're developing a portfolio of initiatives. And one of the first ones we announced is specifically around the uh, issue of protected and conserved areas. And uh, we decided that the momentum was important and we decided to support the goal of protecting 30% of the planet by 2030, which as you all know is a goal that was just adopted as a global goal in Montreal a few weeks ago. Now the challenge is it needs to be done in the right way, in the right places and engaging local communities. And we can, I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about this. In our case, uh, we decided to focus on certain geographies to start so we could learn. We looked at areas that were high in terms of biodiversity, high in terms of carbon stocks, and places where we felt there was the institutional capacity, both in terms of governments and political commitment and organizations that can be supported. Uh, <clears throat> as a result of that, we identified three initial geographies, the Congo Basin, the tropical Andes and the Western Amazon, and the uh, tropical Pacific Ocean. In our first year and a half, we've already allocated and awarded more than $300 million of grants to a number of organizations across 15 countries. We can talk a little bit more about challenges and opportunities that we have learned. Let's just say that we, uh, one of the challenges we have, and we can dig into it, is how to uh, mobilize that funding. For a large fund like us that doesn't have representation there on the ground, is how do you get the money to the right people? And uh, we've tried a variety of mechanisms. We estimate that about probably between 40 and 50% of that funding is going to go to support local organizations through a variety of mechanisms. And this is a very important issue we should dig into. One of them being RI. And we decided to support both RI in an alliance with the Global Alliance of Territorial Communities to make a set of grants that sort of fall under the clarifier umbrella. So um, I think it's been less than a year. It's too early to know exactly what the results are going to be. But we think that there is no way we can achieve that global goal of protecting 30% of the planet if we don't include and empower local communities to do this because it's the only way we can get to 30% given the customary rights. And we can dig yeah. into a lot of those issues yeah. during the panel. And how direct is direct funding? Correct. I think we might come to, and what have we learned Correct. so far? But before we get to that, Michelle uh, from Nestle, yeah, thanks, Liz, and thanks for the invitation to WRI uh, today as well. Um, I first just want to share a little bit of context. So I'm the Global Sustainable Sourcing Lead for Pulp and Paper at Nestle, and also um, lead our work on the Global Reforestation Program, which is part of our forest positive strategy. Um, so. To give a little bit of context, um, I want to start to just share uh, how we approach this, how Nestle, what actually forest positive means, what a forest positive strategy is uh, at Nestle, and how within this IPLC actually eff those efforts fit in. Um, so just taking a step back, in 2019, Nestle made a commitment to become, 20, uh, to become net zero by 2050. And what that means is halving its emission uh, by 2030. Um, as an ag and food company, uh, as you might all know, uh, the biggest impact really comes from our ingredients. So how do we source our ingredients? It's actually over 70% of the footprint that comes from that. So when you look at our net zero roadmap, you'll see a lot of the activities uh, that are driving or integrated that will be rolled out now over the coming years are focused on agroforestry, regenerative agriculture, um, restoring and uh, protecting or uh, degraded land um, and conserving also areas that are part of our supply chain. Um, in parallel, in 2021, 
uh, the forest positive strategy was launched. And this is um, quite important because the forest positive strategy has been building on 10 years of learning, uh, executing the no deforestation free commitment of Nestle. Um, and what we learned during those 10 years was really around um, how not just focusing on deforestation is actually sufficient to solve this challenge. We also need to have an active role that an organization like Nestle plays in the restoration and conservation um, within landscapes that are part of our supply chain. And so this is uh, important to set it up as a long-term strategy and also a strategy that actually addresses deforestation in the future, not just today. Um, so with that, our forest positive strategy is set up in three pillars. The first one being focused on no deforestation, so avoiding, um, at maintain, achieving our targets and then maintaining that over the coming years. Um, the second pillar being restoring and participating in an active way in the conservation of areas that are linked to our supply chain. And then also the third one being uh, the landscape, sustainable landscape. So how do we actually uh, support and empower kind of the protection or enablement of uh, continuous sustainable landscapes in our supply chain? You can imagine that shifting from kind of where we were before required actually a really big mindset shift overall for the organization. So there are two key elements that had to shift. The first one being we can't just focus on deforestation uh, today. We also need to have an active role in the restoration as an organization. And the second mindset shift was really around not just focusing on single sites within our supply chain, but actually understanding they're part of a more holistic landscape. And so with this, uh, projects become more complex, more multidimensional, uh, mu much more uh, stakeholders to get engaged. And it's really in that context where the IPLC piece fits. So from a forest positive strategy, IPLC and the efforts and uh, securing land rights is really one of the key enablers of the strategy. And with that, um, you know, we are working on two kind of lenses of this. The first one being, how are we looking at it from a risk perspective? So working on an action plan um, that is called our IPLC land rights action plan um, on uh, really allowing us to figure out where do we, how do we address risks? How do we uh, engage and capacitate our suppliers to consider and ensure that they implement FPIC? And then also how do we assess our own programs to ensure that we're doing that across the board. And the second lens is um, the aspect of empowerment. So how can we really ensure that IPLC becomes stewards of the force, which they already are, but how can an organization be part of that and really um, execute projects and support projects where that happens? And I hope I can dive into a very concrete example afterwards. As well. Excellent. In fact, I'm going to ask you all to do exactly that now. Uh, start, Johnson, if you can give us some very practical examples of your program in the field. Okay. Um, in each of the project, country projects, uh, we are having uh, successful experiences, and what we do at the global level is just exchange. By the way, they don't have to be successful, because oh. we, we <laughs> want to learn <laughs> what's done. <coughs> Let me put in a couple of examples. One, one is uh, in Peru. I, I like to uh, talk about this. It's about the land tenure, right? Uh, they are proposing to uh, uh, get the title of lands, I think, about 800,000 with the project, but they reach only 200,000. And the lesson learned there is that usually when they do this process with the government, it takes about 20 or 30 years. And having the funding directly, the, the communities, and even using the funding to bring the governments to the territories, it took about two years in order to have land title. And they mm. got 200,000 hectares with, with the DGM, DGM project. That is really, really impressive how when communities have the money, they can make the process really fast and, and good for, for everyone, for communities and for the environment. Um, the other thing in terms of, um, it's coming to my mind is the uh, gender equity. Uh, when we started, um, the participation of women in the uh, National Exchange Committee 
uh, the Global Steering Committee was really low. But uh, over time, uh, even in the, in the participation for projects, you know, they put it indicators in each of the countries in order to see, uh, to increase the participation of the women, how they receive the funding, and also how they are going to engage in the leadership of the projects at the national level. So I would say that based on those indicators that they have used at the national level, uh, we have seen like a re at least 40 to 45 percent of participation of women in the participation of the project and also uh, 35 percent in the participation in the leadership of the project. So which is a good indicator that, mm. you know, having funding and by themselves deciding on, on the indicators, achieving great things. Right. Cecile, is that enough? 40, 45? 45, yeah. Getting that. <laughs> yeah. It's very encouraging. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Christian, are you yet ready? I know you... It, yeah, it, you as I mentioned before, I think it's too early to tell, but I'll, let me just switch to a different geography to, to broaden the conversation. And in the Congo Basin, for example, we're very interested and very hopeful about what may happen in, in DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, specific, specifically Eastern DRC, which is an area of high, high importance for biodiversity and carbon. It's also a very complicated place to work because of governance. But the, the DRC government has actually passed some legislation now really looking at tenure rights for local communities. So we're supporting not only strengthening some of the protected areas that we established, like Cahusi Viega and some of the other areas, and let me acknowledge right up front that in Africa in particular, there's a very tragic historical uh, evidence here about uh, some conservation efforts that led directly to the displacement of communities. So part of what we do here is really take advantage of this opportunity, working with RRI and REPELEC, which is one of the partner organizations of, of the Global Alliance of Territorial Communities, and really trying to secure the tenure rights for at least 5 million hectares of community reserves around some of these protected areas, which we think is a really interesting opportunity. The one thing I will say is that in our case, we're interested not only in securing tenure rights, but making sure that these areas are effectively conserved. And this is a real issue, and we were just mentioning with Johnson. Uh, I'm originally from Colombia. 30 years ago, we started doing this. Securing tenure rights by itself does not guarantee good conservation outcomes. I think we really need to look at that and uh, how we really take this. And that was the point you were making. So uh, jury's still yeah. out. We'll see exactly how it works. But uh, we are certainly hopeful. We're making longer-term four- and five-year investments, trying to do this in the countries I mentioned. So uh, we'll come back Excellent. and hopefully have some data Thanks, in a year Mr. or two. Also, um, I think it's a bit early for Enable. But uh, from capacity building program, which we've been uh, financing for 10 years, I think we have many uh, success stories. And uh, one I might say is that uh, we're not only World Bank, but other donors as well. We've been supporting these intermediary organizations, local indigenous people's organizations, in managing finance. So now many of them, including Repalek and Sotsil in Guatemala, are becoming implementing agencies for bigger funds. Okay. So this is a capacity building in terms of management of finance, administering projects, but also uh, uh, leadership, uh, experiences, I think built a lot of capacities in these intermediary organizations. And the same is happening in the country level organization. We see that many organizations we've been supporting through this intermediary, they became a champions of driving agenda of indigenous peoples at the national level. Because through Red Plus, which is uh, in many countries was the beginning of a dialogue yeah. between indigenous peoples and uh, governments uh, around land tenure, not always maybe starting positively, but through this dialogue, a lot of interesting development have been uh, achieved, including changing in legislations, in bringing indigenous peoples' agenda into other issues like health, education. So I think this is, was a big advantage of uh, capacity building program of uh, FCPF, which uh, brought these issues up front at the national level. Great, super. Uh, Michelle. Um, yeah, one project that came to mind reflecting on that question was a project that we're currently working on in uh, BC, Canada. 
Um, so just to give a very concrete example of how that plays out within our context, supply chains and so on. Um, we found in BC Canada that we are sourcing or the wood at one point in our supply chain is coming from that region. And some of the suppliers there, specifically in that geography, were not respecting FPIC, which is one of our um, key fundamental requirements and concept of that in our responsible sourcing guidance. Um, so the local Tseke uh, Dene Nation and our implementation partner, Earthworm Foundation, came to us with a project opportunity to actually address or work on this. Uh, we came together with Earthworm Foundation, with Tsekedene and the other funding uh, members or uh, companies that are part of the Earthworm Foundation members and have been working now over the past two years on executing very specific uh, actions. Um, in 2022 now, we've finalized, or they have finalized, take it in it together with Earthworm support and capacity building, an HCV assessment, so they were able to set up uh, and identify one of the regions that are critical to them, and develop an HCV assessment, again, that is, HCV is a key concept in our responsible sourcing guidance, so allowing them to really build on these type of tools that are part of our um, language and, and toolbox. Uh, they, they set up that assessment. They've also now launched the Ingenica, which is an indigenous-led and protected area. Um, we had one week together where we were able to be there on their invitation to really learn and understand kind of their culture, their concepts. And then the last piece that we're now continuously working on will be more about how do we support them ongoing to monitor um, and address logging or no logging in those areas with the forestry companies in the space. Um, so ensuring that there's a monitoring setup where uh, they can kind of oversee that no logging happens in Chuaza, no logging happens in Lingenica, and then also that uh, the companies, the forestry companies in that space really respect the Tsekedene Nation forest stewardship framework that they developed. Um, so just one idea or one opportunity of how we've been executing that. Um, obviously, we're at the start of the journey, so there's a lot to learn. Um, and uh, I think this is a great project to look to. Excellent. So in actual fact, all your initiatives are works in progress. But do you have enough flexibility to, in your projects to change directions slightly? or to demand, say, look, this isn't working, we need to do this a different way. If you could give some opinions on that. And also, a couple of questions that are, are bothering me a little. I, I just want to remind ourselves that FPIC applies to indigenous people. Great. It has not been extended to all communities, like many of the communities you're working in Eastern DRC, do not define themselves as indigenous peoples. Is there, is there room, for example, for getting governments, for getting regional organizations to start extending FPIC really to the whole community land sector, whether that Afro-descendants, self-defined IP or other customary communities who all do share a certain uh, uh, problem with securing their land and preventing, we haven't discussed it, it's not really in this panel, but oil, uh, mining, all these other threats to their, to their lands. Is there any scope for FPIC do you think through your initiatives for you to play a role uh, to, to mobilize that? So maybe again, Johnson, if you can go ahead. And also can you uh, give us, I cut you off when you were going to give some more examples. Yes, Feel free. I'm, uh, we're not doing too badly on time. So <laughs> I'm gonna give you a few more minutes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um... I like to share a couple ideas in terms of how things have changed since uh, this experience from um, Burkina Faso where we have 
around 600 proposals for projects and only awarded like, I think, 20, 25 projects. And the rest of the countries, for example, in Brazil and also in DRC, I like the approach they, they have taken there, which is not to make communities to compete each other and just request this ecosystem to come together and make a proposal because the funding is their, their money. It's not, they are not competing for other money. They, it, this is their money. So that's why in Brazil they have decided, okay, we don't want you to compete. In DRC, the same thing. And in, in many cases, so just taking some communities to sit together and make decisions how they are going to use this funding for the goals of the, the, the projects in, in that country. So that was really interesting to see how we are changing from the competing process of you know calls for proposals to having funding secure and implement the projects uh, in, in those areas. That's one important uh, change that we have observed. And, and really impactful, you know, it's, we are learning from, from, from those experiences. The other one is, um, I would say, um, um, when, when communities receive the funding, that's we have observed that they said this is our project and sometimes they believe that this is not connected with anything else. It's just ours and it's our decision, we will see how we're going to implement this. And actually, the DGM project is connected with the forest investment program. And the forest investment program is to work on, on red, red plus basically, uh, red reducing uh, you know, deforestation and, and, and degradation. And then communities, they were saying that perhaps we are not connected with that project. We are not connected with anything else. This is our, our project, and we are going to implement this. Sometimes this is, I think, important to remind that uh, um, the activities in the community somehow need to be connected with the global interests that we are doing because we are contributing as communities, being uh, talking as, as indigenous person. So how we are connecting with global things? With the DGM, we are connecting with the, the local communities and indigenous people's platform under the Climate Change Convention, for instance. We are connecting, we're trying to uh, fit, uh, you know, with the information from our project. So that's important. But sometimes we are trying to be isolated and I see a problem there. The problem is that uh, when we are trying to get as indigenous funding from the Green Climate Fund, we need to go through the government and get their authorization and see if we are aligned with the national, uh, the national development plan, for instance, in the, in, in the country. So if we are not aligned with that, how are we going to get access to the Green Climate Fund? Because they have to ultimately make decisions, right, that this project is important for the country. And that is a problem that I see that we are trying to, uh, uh, you know, work with communities to recommend that even our life programs in the communities need to be connected with something else. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah governments. Right, thanks. Uh, please, Christian. Um, so one of the nice things about private philanthropy is that we do have the flexibility to be able to deploy the funds quicker to the right places, take risks, and uh, in our case, for example, when we did that first set of grants, we actually went from concept to approval in a matter of a few weeks. So it uh. doesn't take two or three years. Having said that, <laughs> having said that, the challenge is figuring out who are the right players and how do you support. In our first set of grants, the challenge we had at that point is, for tax reasons, we could only fund organizations that were registered in the U.S. Uh which created an issue, and even though we did use intermediaries and other mechanisms, including RI, as mechanisms to get the funding there, we're now looking at ways that we can actually create mechanisms to start funding national organizations. Uh, and that's something we've, we're have we sorting out right now. But one of the issues that we have seen is, and this is what I was mentioning to Liz, is what, what does direct funding actually mean? Because it's an interesting issue. For an organization like us, we're, we're not designed and we will not have the capability to be able to give $50,000 grants on the ground to a local community. We just can't do it, given the size and what we do. And yet we're committed to trying to get that funding there. The question is, how do we do it? And there are a variety of mechanisms. One is looking at working with someone like GATC and figure out how we do it and RI and creating a fund that can be managed there. Uh, and we'll go from the Global Alliance to the regional organizations, to the national organizations, to the local communities. But one lesson we've learned is even though in some cases we've actually dispersed the funds very early, it takes even within that mechanism over a year to get those funds to the ground. Mm. So there's a challenge there. In other cases, we can work with some of the international NGOs that have had a long-standing commitment relationship with local communities and get the funding through them to the local communities. 
which is also clearly in some ways even quicker. Uh, and in some areas like Bolivia, for example, we've been supporting, we've been talking to local communities saying, how would you like this funding to be channeled? And in some cases, they'll come back and say, we would like it done through some of the international NGOs. Uh, what we won't do is channel it through governments or through UN agencies in our case. And that's with all due respect. We think that there's, there's a role there for governments to do this and private sector. But in our case, we can complement this. So I think jury's still out in terms of how we do it effectively with our commitment and efficiently. I think this is an important issue because one of the complaints I've heard is it takes a long time. And actually, let me address very quickly one comment that came up in the previous panel uh, related to the IPOC pledge in Glasgow. Uh, yes, there was a pledge for $1.7 million. That was for specifically forest-based communities. Uh, we did, and we joined as one of the private donors in that pledge. There was a report that was issued in Montreal that actually specifically uh, uh, has some accountability of how much funding was gone. It's substantial. It's almost 20% of the funding has already been distributed. The challenge is the majority of that is still not going directly or reaching the people in a quick, efficient way. But there is some transparency and some accountability around that. Not that it can be improved. I think there's many lessons. But we're certainly trying to be at the table and learn from others in terms of what the experiences are. So I'll stop there. Great. If we have time, we can come back yeah. and dig into it. I, we should, yeah. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, I actually want to build on a lot of comments you just made, Christian. I think yeah. what the private sector has is we can be pretty flexible in adjusting what the scope is um, and also getting things quickly to communities if we need to. Um, I think they're thinking about the project I just mentioned before. There are three key learnings that we got from the project. The first one being it's really critical that um, the communities, but also we work with the right partners. And partnership is really important. And I'm saying this because when we were starting this work, it was pretty quickly, pretty visible that we work on very different timelines, very different speeds. You know, corporate settings are quarterly updates, KPIs, we need to see progress, yeah. versus communities are much more decisions are made, uh, discussing with elders. It can take weeks, months. Um, to engage and build that trust. And so having the right partner that builds that bridge between us as an organization and the community on the ground is really critical. Um, it's also helpful for us because there's so many communities out there. IPLC communities, very diverse. So the partner uh, helps us to understand that and working with the right partner will also allow uh, the IPLC community to get the right tools that they might need in, in the setting or with the organization that we work for. So this is one of the first yeah. learnings. The second learning was really about um, us not, um, you know, thinking about the importance of partnership and collaboration with the people. So this project actually came to us from the community. Um, so it's not it's with the people, not for the people. It's not us saying we need this, but actually the community telling us actually as a next step this coming year, we would like to work on this because this is our next evolution of the project and makes sense to us. And so that's important. And finally, I would say the last uh, learning that we got was really about our role as a company is not really driving the projects. It's really there to see how can we use our influence uh, via our supply chain, via the actors to say, the vision of the Tseke Dana Nation is not just important to the local community, it's actually also important to other actors like us. And how can we then bring other stakeholders in that environment on board um, and illustrate that this is something to work on. So for us, these three points were critical to be able to work on that and any opportunities or IPLCs who yeah. want to work that way, it's uh, something we would love to discuss. So can I just ask you on that last point, other stakeholders, do you mean other firms, other companies? Yeah, in this uh, specific context of the project, it's, it would be the forestry industry, obviously, because that's okay. our supply chain uh, influence from that angle. In other uh, contexts, it can be the government, you know, other um, national stakeholders to also help build the bridges there. Okay, can I just follow up with you specifically on this? I'm sure you're aware of the EU's new law, uh, and you're in the paper and pulp. You're leading on that. 
Do you have any, uh, do you feel that uh, sh there's been quite a lot of complaint that the law says nothing about and we will also ensure there is a human rights, respect for human rights. Why is that? How did that happen, do you know? Was it, were companies involved in that in saying, no, we don't want to be responsible for that? Or was it governments? What, uh, and how can that become a norm that it isn't just uh, that, that in the case of forestry that it's sustainable and that it doesn't, you know, we're not causing deforestation, but in the process of acquiring all those products, how can we make sure human rights, and I'm particularly a little biased here, land rights are being respected or promoted, that the right of, I, of communities to their land is being promoted. I, I don't know if that's uh, going to blindside you, that kind of no, question? I, I think I'll try to respond to what I, what right. I can, but I, I mean, I know there's, there was a lot of different discussion going into the EU reg legislation, so I personally haven't been part of all that discussion. There's an entire team, uh, legal and advocacy team, you know, within, the, within companies that, that deal with that. Um, what I do uh, or can comment on is just the critical piece of IPLC and the importance and understanding of securing land rights and rights for local communities is critical for corporate ambitious commitments to get to achieve the impact on the social side, on the environmental side, achieving no deforestation, being able to um, achieve successful nature-based you know, projects. And so I think that we're all aligned in that direction and that should happen. Now the legislation uh, is going to be how it will impact companies. It will really help drive like adjusting the organizational setup of making that core already from a no deforestation perspective. Now figuring out how can we link that and ensure that the land rights piece is not missed will be probably continuously to be a work that everyone needs to push for. And I think um, Nestle will push for that as uh, just explained via the forest positive kind of direction, ambition, and where we are heading towards. Great, thank you. So in 10 years, Nestle can lead in saying we want a change to this legislation. That yeah? would be the hope, I guess. <laughs> Great, <laughs> thank you, Nestle. Right, brilliant. Okay, I think it's time we have some questions from the floor. Oh, I wanted to give Ah, questions. many. <laughs> right, so, yeah. Can I Feel talk about free either challenges? a general question or to a specific uh, speaker. So remember, we've got. Hello, hello. It's uh, better, I think, if you pick who the question is for, so we don't have the whole panel answering to. Yeah, good point. Name who you are and who it's for. Thank you all very much uh, for, for. Oh, this. I'm sorry. I can do later. Yeah, I am so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it's for As uh, Asil, mm -hmm. your question? No, no, Let's go, go ahead. ahead. No, go no, ahead. don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much for this panel discussion. My name is Roni Brodsky and I work for the Nature Conservancy's Global Program for Conservation in Partnership with Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities. I serve as the Director of Community and Indigenous-Led Finance. I have a two-part question. Uh, one is harking back to the previous dis uh, panel's discussion on burden of reporting requirements that Gustavo talked about. So I'm curious to hear, this is, this is kind of for a broad set of panelists, um, uh, I think uh, Asil, Christian, um, and Arden I'm Johnson, of course, uh, how you are looking at reporting requirements and ways that uh, your work can both achieve needs in assuring accountability and trust. We can hear. Okay. Uh, while while also increasing, uh, increasing inclusivity and uh, and uh, reducing burden of reporting requirements. Thank you. 
And this is, uh, so that's part one of my question. And the second uh, question is more directed to Christiane. I was very interested to hear about your point on asking community groups how they would like to receive their funding via intermediaries. And in all of this discussion around direct donor uh, financing and questions around what does that really mean, you raised, uh, you raised the point that in cases like Bezos Earth Fund, you can't directly fund you know, small grants, uh, while at the same time there's this rising uh, tide of critique against intermediaries and the extent to which, uh, to which uh, funding gets caught up within intermediaries. So I'd like to hear more about this process, really, of soliciting from community groups. First of all, how do you identify those community groups? Um, and then second of all, how do you really solicit from them information on uh, which intermediaries from whom they'd like to receive their funding? So how do you kind of work from the bottom up to smooth out a lot of problems in intermediation? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take, we'll take one yeah. more before uh, responding. Hi, great panel, thanks so much. Um, my name is Amy Kokenauer, I'm with Cadasta Foundation. One of the pieces I wanted to bring to the table in this conversation around land rights and securing land tenure, um, picking up on something you said, Johnson, about the Peru example, one of the, one of the key constraints that we see is uh, basically lack of government land administration, processes, capacity, technology, uh, outreach staffing. Um, so a lot of the work is really dependent on these multi-sectoral partnerships with government to, because they're the ones who issue and recognize formal legal rights. So I'd love to just hear, Johnson, where that has shown up in some of your work and, and anyone else who wants to comment, comment on that, maybe Michelle. Um, how do you bridge that gap um, with government to ensure that government is playing a role with indigenous and local communities to, to get the job done, essentially. Okay, so we're Great. gonna take two more, so, so is it, are you guys okay? It's fine. Yeah. Uh, just also, uh, there was an internet question for you, uh, Johnson. It says, Peru's example is impressive. Was it just the result of funding to communities and that this attracted you know, that this would mobilize, I think, what they mean, uh, land titling by government, or were there other key conditions on that particular Peruvian uh, case? Good. So, do you want to get asked two more questions? I hope you haven't forgotten all the questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. My name is Akimar and Liria uh, from Kenya. Two questions, one to the World Bank representative and one other to the Bezo Fund. I appreciate the insight from all of you. One of the things we've seen in the UNFCC COP and the CBD COP is a convergence in the commodification and commercialization of nature. And when you look at the foundational work of the World Bank from the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility including the DGM where Johnson spoke about, and now Enable, it's geared at preparing countries for carbon markets. And the question is, and, and so in Paris Article 6, the main discussion was carbon-based approaches. And so the question is, how is the World Bank positioning itself not to facilitate a green grabs associated to carbon credits because especially carbon is an abstract product. It's even difficult to monitor. People can trade on it when local community actors are not aware. And they have been talk about carbon cowboys, you know, mm -hmm. mediating these processes. How can we move? And, and so last on that is basically when you look at DGM and the aspiration of Enable, is more capacity. How do we move beyond the soft skill to actually livelihoods for adaptation for indigenous communities? They need both. Um, and the second question is around what does, it's about what is funded for how long for the Bezo Fund. 
Specifically, one of the things we have realized in the land rights struggle is that there is hardly any money for legal litigation to support legal processes. And the reality of the matter is some corrections like cancelling a title deed can only be done through the court of law. So if we don't fund that, we will never see a cancellation, a return of land of these communities. The second aspect is about how long land rights struggles are intergenerational. So if we are committed to secure these land rights, how willing are we to walk the long haul to see the realization of these rights? Thank you. Thank you. For you. I think we've got plenty of questions. <laughs> we do this round yes. and then get some more. Arsil, could I start with you, please? Yeah, I think we missed me in challenges, so maybe it's exactly yeah. what, <laughs> what questions are. So I think uh, it's a very good question about um, reporting requirements, but more than that, it's what is this fiduciary requirements. Uh, not only World Bank, but all donor organizations require. And, uh, there are, and this is a problem or challenge which we face when we move from intermediaries straight to country level organizations because there is, we have countries where we cannot disburse funds like four million as one project because there is no such capacity to manage this amount of funds or there is no proven experience in managing this kind of funds. And uh, this is a moving sort of uh, uh, evolutioning from DGM, sort of, we've been thinking that it's important not to bypass this. We need to build capacities, and we see that these organizations like Ampedo, Pakcha, Sotsil, which have been intermediary organizations, Tebteba, they can now manage four million dollar funds. So we are trying now to build capacities of organizations on the ground with the help of these intermediary organizations. So what's happening, we are, uh, we are developing sort of a network of uh, capacity builders, so regional, local uh, trainers who can go and help new organizations coming up with uh, building these fiduciary requirements. And I mean, it can resolve one pro uh, problem in terms of building capacity of, I don't know, next week we are having like 20 organizations from Asia uh, building their capacity, how much we can go, right, as the World Bank. So it's important to say uh, that here we also partner with organizations, with these intermediary organizations, how they can also support this process. And I think Bezos Fund, World Bank would love to continue this dialogue. And uh, uh, reporting requirements also need to be uh, more in, uh, innovations. We need to start thinking more about the result-based finance, right? So not like process-based finance, but result-based finance. And we are now uh, starting to look at this model for enable how we can make it easier for community organizations to uh, not to report on all inputs, but a report on results which we agreed on, right? So it's, it's and I think this is very uh, interesting area where we all have to work on and help capacities on the ground. And uh, uh, about uh, Cameron, very good. Uh, should I go further or? Yes, please. Yeah. Please, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a very good question, Cameron. You raised about these green grabs, and uh, and I think it comes back to Lee's point on FP and on timing. I know we are notorious World Bank in terms of timing. It takes a lot of uh, time to prepare projects. In, in Enable in Indonesia have been taken a year to prepare and because of FPIC, because this, uh, they go to each community and do FPIC. As you know, our bank's new uh, safeguards yeah. require not only uh, no harm with indigenous peoples, uh, do better. And this FPIC, it's a great instrument to go beyond not harm. But look, what are the interests of the communities, of indigenous people communities, mm -hmm. and how they can be reflected in the different operations. So this is, uh, 
of course, I think it's important to apply FPIC to local communities as well, but I think we are not perfectly applying it yet to indigenous peoples. We are still learning a lot on that, and again, um, it's process which we cannot bypass and do fast. It uh, okay. needs a lot of uh, uh, dedication. And uh, uh, Kimaran asked, uh, enough of capacity building? This is what we've heard from um, local organization, and it's true. And that's why Enable is not capacity. It's providing resources on the ground to unplug result-based payments. So I'll give you an example. In uh, Indonesia, for example, uh, you know, result-based payment will be $80 million. And uh, it will be one of the mission reduction is alternative livelihood of communities. It sounds easy, right? But this is the whole shift in how communities' economics work, right? So how to do this? How communities can form business plans? How they can pilot this initiative? This is what Enable been, will be doing, giving money for livelihood. Uh, support for local economies and for developing indigenous economies by indigenous communities themselves. Hopefully, I, I, we are just starting, but I really hope that it will happen. Okay, just there was another internet question for you. Mm. Just a little bit, can you clarify as a World Bank project, how do you get down to the grassroots? Do you want to just make Enable. another? Yeah, because we, I've been talking about two programs, capacity yeah. building, where yeah. we use this intermediary organizations yeah. like Ripalak to uh, okay. uh, provide further, or uh, enable uh, will be four, three, four million dollars, we don't have yeah. much funds, uh, will go to countries where we have emission reduction programs. Right now okay. it's 15 countries, but we hope with the launching of our new umbrella scale sort of a huge umbrella for result-based climate finance. Enable will grow as well, and uh, we will go to other countries as well. So these organizations yeah. will be channeling this money to the community groups to access result-based climate finance, benefit sharing arrangements. Okay, great. Is it clear, uh, uh, Yeah. We could have an hour or two on this subject, but I know, <laughs> yeah. <it's laughs> Christian, can you uh, a couple of questions directed to you? Yeah. So let me start with the the, um, the question about our our funding horizons and sort of what we do. Uh, we are willing to take longer term uh, commitments. As a matter of fact, some of our grants are five years out. But remember, the current way the fund is structured is to be fully expended by 2030. So we're not a setting of endowment. We're not trying to do something long term. We feel that this is the decisive decade when we need to do it. Having said that, we do recognize that one and two year grants don't do the trick. Now, so in general, the way we've been approached is four or five years, something like this, which can be renewable if you take something like that. So it's a, it's a medium sized thing, but we're not going to be doing 20 year grants because we're not set up that way. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of where we're looking at. Um, in terms of some of our reporting requirements, uh, uh, we actually have an amazing thing called the six-page rule, which was developed by Bezos himself, which is um, none of our proposals can be more than six pages long, full stop. Uh, Solange was so happy when we got the RI one that uh, we could do it. Uh, but having said that, they do have to be results-based. They do have to have very clear outcomes, uh, which makes it harder. And the reporting is coming in now because we do use a lot of intermediaries. Um, what I can cannot tell you right now is exactly how are those reports between our intermediaries and the individual groups. Certainly from our point of view, we recognize the limitations. They can be very short, very simple. We do want to make sure they all add up. And one thing we're experimenting, we'll see exactly how it plays out, is that in each of these geographies, we're actually having meetings with all of our grantees together. So these are not reports that are coming to us. But for example, we had a meeting in Libreville uh, with Repelec and all our grantees in the Congo Basin together for three days, where every one of them presented their own reports, shared the lessons, and figured out how they could work together. So it's reporting to each other, because one of the things we require is not only outcomes in terms of your individual goals, but collective outcomes that we're all moving the needle toward this 30 by 30 in the region. We'll see how it works out. We're <coughs> we have a meeting next month in Panama for the Eastern Tropical Pacific Corridor. We'll see how it plays out. But it's not just reporting to us. It's reporting to each other and learning about this. 
Now, I think to your last question um, about how we um, gather information from local grantees, there's, what I mentioned is an example. They tend to be so far much more haphazard, to be candid. It's, we go to a place, we recognize an issue, we know it, we visit, we talk to them. We, uh, but we do not have a systematic approach or way of doing it, which we probably should in some ways figure out a, a more uh, thorough way of getting input from the real local communities about what are the best mechanisms. And I'll just finish with one comment. We, we all use the term intermediaries. We need some kind of, but there are many kinds of intermediaries, right? I think one size does not fit all. I would say some of the international groups are intermediaries. Um, RI can be an intermediary of various groups. And there are cases, one of the things that we're experimenting right now is having some groups that can be companions to these local groups that are formulating the proposals, but the grants are actually going directly to the groups. So it doesn't mean that the money has to flow through the intermediary. Sometimes you can actually disperse directly, but the role of the intermediary is more helping build the pipeline. But we're learning. I don't know exactly what's the best solution. And I'd love to hear and learn from all of you. Thank you. Great. Can I be an intermediary? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, I think that's really interesting. And there's probably a lot of potential for innovation on precisely that point, how you get money and who's helping the community make sure the money is, is spent well. Right, Johnson, you had okay. about 22 questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, let me say something about the reporting. Um, in, in the projects, you know, the technical support, the uh, NGOs, they are providing the reports, but it, something interesting is happening. In Brazil and in Mozambique, they have developed something in order to make the leaders to make the report or read what's going on with the different projects having a tablet. So they have a tablet, a program, and they are looking, you know, like what's going on in one project or another project, and they make recommendations and they follow up whatever they want to hold up in, with the project. So it's important to engage you know, the communities, the leaders, in order to see what's going on with the projects. And they help for the report process. And then you know, the implementing agencies, they are in charge of the reporting process. And also at the global level, we collect all the reports and we provide a, an annual and semi-annual report as well um, for the DGM project. That, so that's how we, we, we engage with communities uh, in you know, their own capacity to uh, be involved in the reporting process. About the Peru case, land tenure, I think it's important to understand that whatever pol uh, policies we decide in the countries, the implementation is a challenge because there's no capacity in the government to implement any policy. Give the name, any policy. They, they say that they, we don't know the community, so they need capacity building on that uh, in order to implement. Also, we need to have our own people in the government in order to help to implement that. We have seen many cases that if they don't understand that, you know, nothing is going to happen. Even we create a good national legislation in the implementation, we will fail because they, they don't have capacity at the, at the government. Uh, and the land tenure is that the case. The second thing about the land tenure in Peru is that it's not only the money there, but it's also the capacity of the organization. Uh, the second, national mobilization, because they've been requesting to the government to recognize the 20 million hectares that, is, that belongs to indigenous peoples in Peru. So they are fighting for that. It's a mobilization also. And also it's part of the interest of the NDCs that the government has committed with the, with the climate change in their NDCs to include forests. So, you know, it's perfect connection, but it's, with the support of communities, the, the government's also reaching out there. And finally, I want to say something about direct access. I come from from uh, you know, for a village, and usually the leaders that we we select, we nominate to run our organization, we select them in order to fight for our rights, right, or the land. But I see that the structure that we have in our organization, perhaps they are, we are, we are not, we have not changed the, the structure of, of the organization to receive the money. And that's one of the, the issues that we have internally. And I was remembering that once in 2015 when Norway said that we, had, we have $200 million for indigenous peoples. Then I was talking with a colleague of the Amazon, and he said that they should write a check for us and we know what to do. I said it's not simple like that, and, and sometimes we yeah. believe in the community. It's just a matter of you know, having a check and then we implement. But we believe, I believe that uh, strongly that we still need to in our organizations to see how we can shift a little bit the, the 
organizations and structures in order to respond, this needs to receive funding to implement our own project. I, I see really great examples with this funding created in Brazil and same in other, in other uh, organizations in order to receive funding. That's a creative thing, you know, in order to overcome this issue that we are not prepared in the communities to receive big amounts of money. Okay, that's very important along with the issue of just community governance, which I'm sure, Asil, that's something you're very enabled, be very involved in. But yeah, just throwing money at a kid, it can disappear too. We all know that. All of us have been in the field. Many, probably everybody in this room has worked in the field. And transparency even within communities and inclusion in the first uh, instance. And then accountability is a big issue. How much the inter... Maybe conditionalities for intermediaries to make sure A, B, C, D, E is happening. I don't know. This is something for another discussion, perhaps. Can I can ask I, how much time do we have? Yes. Sorry, can Michelle. I address one of the questions on kind of the governance, working with governments, uh, multi-stakeholder? Do we have time? Five more minutes? OK. We could take one last question then after Michelle. Yeah. So just wanted to share, um, we've tried different ways of doing that. So one example is in our palm supply chain in Indonesia, actually, instead of working with the government, we supported communities accessing land rights and supporting the process to getting there. I think one of the realizations is if we would want to do that everywhere, that's going to be impossible to do. Like governments also have a role to play. Um, so that was one kind of takeaway in learning um, in another example, or in some projects that we have, especially at the landscape level, um, as, for example, in Ivory Coast, we have a project working with hand in hand with the government there uh, of the Ivory Coast on cavalry forests. So, finding alternative ways of how do farming communities actually find uh, different access or s solutions. Um, instead of needing to deforest and enter like the protected area. So that's one project um, there. It's a bit less related to land rights, but just to indicate kind of we, th those are setups that also work. Um, but I do think there are also regions, uh, for example, in Chile, which is one of a, a, you know, a huge production area for pulp and paper specifically, some of the topics around land rights are very complex. They're historic. There are legacy topics, and we also have uh, markets with a Nestle that need to get engaged. So our IPLC action plan is aiming to help uh, figure out how do we uh, in influence or use our advocacy to engage with those type in those type of situations in those type of governments. But we won't probably solve all of these ourselves. We're just one organization. Uh, governments also need to be there, different stakeholders need to be there, so it's really critical to bring that together where that's possible. Thank you very much. Are there, is there one more question from, ah. Yeah, thanks, great, great discussion. Simon Hall here with the uh, Walmart Foundation. This is a question for, for ASIL. Um, Loved what you said about sort of integration and sort of nesting projects and, and creating sort of an ongoing cycle where finance and capital can get down to some of those local levels. Um, but a question about sort of the structural and sort of the strategy around that. So I think we've heard today, and it's well documented, um, indigenous territories, local communities have a really good track record of conservation and sustainability. So what that means is that the emissions profile associated with some of those regions looks quite different than like an active deforestation frontier that we would see where agriculture is sort of encroaching in on some of those forested areas. Um, and so when we think about that in the context of carbon markets, Red Plus, J Red, um, just generally sort of how we are monetizing that and creating the capital flows back to those local levels for the implementation and driving results. Like, how does that sort of set up? What's the incentive structure there? Um, is it a low ceiling for some of these areas to tap into that capital? Um, do we need a mindset shift to sort of move away from such a sort of overemphasis on carbon and to think about biodiversity? And basically trying to balance out this sort of high forest, low deforestation kind of regions, which are critically important to, to conserve, we don't end up 
and sort of this cascading loss of nature that we see elsewhere because restoration is so incredibly expensive, takes so much time. Obviously, it's needed, but if we can avoid that in the first place, that's a, much, that's a win for everyone. And so how are you thinking about that from the World Bank context in terms of like maybe sort of complementing the jurisdictional red plus and those types of approaches with a more holistic nature biodiversity kind of components? Thanks. Thank you. And there was actually a couple of other. Can we just take them very quickly? Let's see. Yeah, USAID retired. I've been in carbon, landscape carbon finance ever since. Our first company just sold. We're doing another one. It's all about the data. But there are two things out there in the big bad market. One is called the secondary risk market, and the other one is carbon futures banking, which is, of course, necessary for reforestation, afforestation, great green wall, and everything. And these are two instruments that are out there. I'm not a finance person. I was a donor anthropologist back in the day, but they are out there. They're part of the institutional landscape. And everything that's been described here today is very bankable in those settings. So, um, but those people, and, and, and my, my, my question really is, they're anthropologists, they're blue state environmentalists, they're red state agriculturalists, that was, my cone at aid, and then there's the banking community, futures market, and these people are not in the same room. They're not in this room. Although the last question was along those lines, and yet there are enormous possibilities for the kind of communities because they've proven that they can manage the landscape to meet these targets that are imperative, and so there's a institutional resource out there has long been recognized by this organization, but it's very bankable if that dialogue starts. And I don't know that the World Bank has made that happen. And maybe it should have, I don't know. I always looked across the street in my career from USA to the World Bank, but um, there were high hopes back in the day, and our company did one of the FCPFs uh, it, you know, uh, ERPDs and, uh, but there are these institutional divisions between big bank bankers who, yes, admittedly know nothing about what you're talking about in here, but they have mechanisms. They're looking for these kind of value propositions and how to build that bridge. Thank you. Uh, so, Asa, would you like to respond to Oh, <laughs> it's one million dollar question. Uh, it's um, also very much linked to, I didn't respond to Kimaran question about carbon cowboys, yeah. greenwashing, grabbing, carbon grabbing. I think this is a very important topic where uh, indigenous peoples see, so have to be engaged. And uh, this is where standards which we use now, they are, in my opinion, I'm also anthropologist, in my opinion, are very much carbon-centric. And only now there is this movement going, considering other values, biodiversity, land tenure, inclusion, indigenous people's rights. And uh, here I think we need to work, and in the World Bank we are now working on a new standard, improving our FCPF standard, adding two more dimensions of it, biodiversity value and um, social uh, development value. We want to incentivize, provide additional incentives to the uh, buyers of carbon to buy high integrity uh, credits. Because this is, you can buy a $5 credit, right, which is just offset, or you can buy credit which improved uh, land tenure rights, improved gender issues in this uh, specific jurisdiction. And we all should drive this high integrity uh, emission reduction units and demand that uh, the standards be stronger and more robust. And in terms of, um, uh, I think um, uh, you were asking, uh, who's this? Ah, you, uh, World, World Bank done, what not done. Uh, it's a very complex, uh, 
uh, carbon markets for me at least as an anthropologist. But we all uh, we all have to I think work together in that and bring value. So I see future at least in with the help of Enable start developing community led Red Plus where uh, jurisdictional can go to specific indigenous people's communities where they can we can support building infrastructure for that where they can enter markets on their own because currently there is no such infrastructure it requires a lot of resources and capacities but uh, also standards to being a little bit more flexible so it's okay. uh, uh, my uh, that's your Vision. response. <laughs> yeah, bit of a wake up call on banking. Uh, we're running out of time. Any one last comment uh, from the three of you? Ali will take ourselves as her last comment. Want to start this way? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's okay. go with you. Well, um, no, I, I agree with everyone, even with the first panel about the direct access, access of indigenous peoples to the funding. It's really important and that is a great contribution for the communities in order to strengthen the contribution they are doing for a long time to to the humanity. And I, I, sometimes what I see is that um, uh, we've been for many, many years maybe uh, working or, or saying that we are impacted, you know, just from n not highlighting the contribution that we are giving. And I, I really like when indigenous people started in 92, saying that we are not here to request your, your funding, give me funding for, for this or for that, just for, for that perspective, from that, that, those perspectives. But communities in that time, they said that we have knowledge. We want to contribute with our knowledge. And recently I see that the, at the global level, just in, 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 in Montreal, you know, in the um, discussions there, I saw a lot of, you know, um, uh, insertion of indigenous people's language there, their participation, their contribution, which is great. Mm. And also in climate change for 23 years, I've been working there. And recently I see a lot of uh, um, recognition of the knowledge of indigenous peoples. So I'm really happy to see that, you know, funding is coming to support this contribution that indigenous peoples are doing for both climate and biodiversity conservation. Great, thank you. Christian. <coughs> I think the world is at last waking up to the seriousness of the problems that we're facing and the urgency of doing something about it. And one of the things that's encouraging to me is that now we do realize that nature and climate are completely interlinked. Um, we saw that a little bit in Egypt. We certainly saw some of that in Glasgow, probably less in Egypt. We saw it in Montreal. But we really have to look at these win-win solutions. But what's just starting to get in there is the environmental justice angle, recognizing the impact of climate, the climate's impacts and things are being felt disproportionately by these com local communities and that they have to be key actors in the solution. So I think we're trying to position ourselves as that interface of nature, climate, and environmental justice mm -hmm. as a key solution. I think that's what we would like to see going forward. We'll right. do the best we can. Thank you. I think I would end on um, how, again, just underlying the importance of partnerships and really uh, important to work with the right partners to leveraging the platforms like RI that are there to do that. Um, I think in you know in, in in the context of a company, we would like to work more on these type of projects, like I mentioned, be in in Canada. But we we're we're an organization sourcing from over a hundred countries. Uh, within each of those countries, there are probably dozens of local communities. There's a diversity diversity that is incredible. So. We, we lean on partners to help mm. us understand, to help us manage that diversity. We won't be able to do that all by ourselves, but we're here to learn and to be able to support that process. Great. Well, can I say that I think 10 years ago, we could not have had a panel like this. Uh, it is, so progress has been made. Business is getting engaged. Philanthropies getting really engaged. Uh, I think 10 years ago it would have been just us alone, her own, at the world speaking for the World Bank. <laughs> so that is great. And I, uh, it would be very interesting in five years to meet again and see where things have gone, changed. But I, it's been a great honor for me to, to be 
with you on this panel. And thank you all of you very, very thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, very much, Liz, Peggy, and all the speakers from the first and uh, second panel. This is a great way to start the year. It has been a very thought-provoking dialogue and very inspiring. So we're really looking forward to engaging more with everyone here. And I will not try to summarize anything because everything has been said. This event has been recorded in three languages, French, English, Spanish, and it will be posted on YouTube, so you can later on watch it again, share with your networks. Just to say thank you very much for being here with us today, and again, thank you to the Embassy of Sweden, to Peter, Ingrid, and all your colleagues for hosting us, and we got this space for free, and it's not generally free, for those of you who would like to come back here, it's not for free, just for RRI. <laughs> but thank you very much. It's a green building, great location, and really thanks for providing this space. And uh, we look forward to engaging more with the Embassy of Sweden and with SIDA and everybody here. Thank you so much, uh, Solange. Thank you for the two amazing panels. Thank you for the great questions from the audience and, and from online. It's been such a pleasure to have you here today. I've really learned a lot. I'm going to take a lot with me back to my colleagues, both here in Washington and, and back in Stockholm. I had a, a few points that I, uh, that I take with me specifically. Uh, one is consultation is fine and good, but the power is in financing. And that applies not just uh, to uh, local communities, but also within local communities, for example, empowering women. Uh, we heard some true words of wisdom. If you haven't delivered things in writing, they don't exist. As a bureaucrat, although I haven't gotten the written memo yet, I can assert that that is true. Um, also, as a former aid worker, I recognize, and, and as a donor, you would call it in, in these circumstances, I recognize very much the challenge of not only finding the right partners, but allocating sometimes what is substantial amounts of money to many, many, many small partners. So I found that discussion particularly valuable. And then finally, uh, looking towards the future, I, I appreciated the discussion on innovation in, in financing and in banking, and look forward to following that discussion. So those are just a few thoughts on my side. Uh, thank you again so much uh, for coming. We have a lovely lunch buffet outside, and I look forward to catching up with many of you outside. Thanks. Thank you.